Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Casual Astrology Podcast. Joining me today is Kent Bai, and we're going to talk about astrology and uh, artificial intelligence as a topic that we got into a little bit yesterday on the Astrology Podcast episode, but not a lot. So we're going to get into that, amongst other things, a little bit more today. And a little casual, hopefully a little bit shorter than our five-hour conversation yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty epic. And yet, there's still stuff to discuss. Uh, AI consciousness. I'm sure we'll we'll sort of dip into a, a wide range of different topics. But it's been a great trip. Thanks for having me out here. It's been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, it's fun to kind of do some deep dives in some of these topics. And I think when you look at technology and, and its relationship to technology and astrology, even it's been quite an interesting evolution. And there's still more to discuss in terms of the future of where this is all going. Yeah, so this was let's talk about that a little bit. So this was my first time flying somebody out. It's like we I just talked to you about how, you know, Rick Levine we did that interview on Uranus and then the minor aspects episode when he was just like driving through and occasionally that's pretty much how I've done it. But um yeah, like having you out in the studio has been a different experience and it's allowed us for obviously longer conversation to do some stuff in between and now to record this to sort of have a more casual discussion like after the main one. So it's kind of an interesting thing in terms of where to where to go with the podcast in the future. Yeah, for me, I think about those concepts of serendipitous collisions that I base a lot of my coverage at, at conferences and how you reaching out to invite me to come do this and the investment and all the logistics, it, it kind of creates this ritual space, mm. which so happened to kind of align with my own personal transits, all the stuff that's going on in my life. And it just kind of like, uh, for me, it was like a, in, intuitively, it was like, okay, I, I need to come and have these conversations for whatever it means. And I don't know where they're going to go or who's going to listen to them or what's going to come after this. But it feels like I've been sort of uh, incubating lots of these different ideas and concepts into these other domains. And it's nice to kind of cross pollinate those other insights back over into astrology because that's a lot of my work is just kind of this interdisciplinary fusion of trying to figure out how these things are all connected. Right. Um yeah, and it is a little bit, I think you said it early on, it's kind of like a conference, like this little mini astrology conference, or at least some of the vibe you get at an astrology conference and having really deep conversations with somebody in person about astrology and related things. Yeah, all, most of my Esoteric Voices podcast happened in the Double Tree lobby there in just south of Seattle, um, Toolinger or whatever that city is, but basically the Northwest Astrological Conference by the Nalbandians has gathered up all these different astrologers and the different types of conversations that would happen in that lobby afterwards is what I kind of thrived upon, uh, speaking the language of astrology, but also having conversations of trying to document what people were talking about, but also what the buzz was what for what the conversations were happening within the astrological community. So it kind of recreates that, but and rather than having a big lobby with like 100 astrologers, it's just two astrologers kind of having their own mini conference. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of different ways that I can help accentuate that in the future, or like just use this as an interesting opportunity to capture some of that. But it's been a nice experience. And so last night, so we did the virtual reality episode. It was like five hour recording, and I got kind of hyped about doing the little demo. Aside from the awkward social <laughs> thrusting me into the middle of a party and making me relive all my worst nightmares uh, from earlier <laughs> in my earlier in my life socially. Otherwise, was was impressed by the demonstrate the demo you gave me of your headset. So we went out to like a Best Buy and got one last night for me. Um, which interestingly, it was like the full moon was like going exact, and as we walked out of the Best Buy, we saw it like culminating just above overhead in Gemini, right above the store. Yeah, that the moon started when we started recording right around my ascendant, and by the time it went into that full moon, when we were going out to buy the VR, we we're walking to Best Buy, looking up the full moon, and it just felt like this. I don't know, uh, kind of being in a dialogue with the anima mundi in, in a way, just like the the universe kind of reflecting this intensity of you know going into these ideas about virtual worlds, but then actually buying some of the the headset and the gear here. So you got the Oculus Quest Two, um, and yeah, there's there's certain um, ways around motion sickness that even you know tips and tricks for if you're moving around, and so if you're locomoting around, there could be things for people within VR that make you sick. So there's things that from a design perspective, as well as as you move around in VR, that can help mitigate that. But there can also be a, a period of accommodation of you just getting used to the proper IPD of how far the lens is apart. You got to get that right. And also just getting used to the screen. So there might be some time where you may get some headaches or feel a little sick, but hopefully you'll find your own tolerance of what the triggers for motion sickness are for you. And you'll either pick experiences or know how to kind of mitigate those by 
squinting your eyes or, you know, closing your eyes or, you know, trying to avoid certain things that may be motion sickness triggers. So that's part of the other thing that I think as you were going to bed, we're kind of dealing with some of that. Yeah, but it was fun. We got to meet up with Wonder, your partner and my friend, old friend going a ways back and talk to her a little bit, which, which was really nice because I haven't seen Wonder in person in years, probably since one of the last major astrology conferences. Like, like UAC, UAC. 2018, yeah. Yeah, Chicago in 2018, almost four years ago now. So it was nice to see her and hear her voice. And it was wild seeing her move her hands in VR and her expressiveness was really like coming through and is like really reminding me a little bit more vividly of like her as a person and the energy that she gives off when you're in person talking to her. It was pretty wild. Yeah. Even though she was in in pickle form, uh, <laughs> her avatar. Yeah, pickle. We we sort of I was a banana, uh, she was a pickle and you were a carrot. So we were walking around these virtual worlds talking about all sorts of stuff. So Yeah, it was yeah. a vegetable gang <laughs> representing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um so yeah, that was fun. I mean, it was cool and then yeah, we I did it once we started like running around going to like a different island and stuff to pick out different avatars, get a little bit of motion sickness. So I had to tap out after a little bit. But it was also like a long day of like five hours of podcast recording, which was super intense. And we had just eaten like a big meal of like Indian food, like right before that, which is evidently I read afterwards one of the things you're not supposed to do oh. eat a big meal like before doing oh, okay. the VR thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think over time there, there's ways to kind of help mitigate some of that, like I said. So, um, but people have their own tolerances. And so if you just jump in and start, moving around and locomoting through spaces, that can be a trigger. If you're teleporting, that's another thing there. So um, yeah, but I'm, I'm excited personally for you to have the VR and to start to have more casual gatherings and meetups. And right. there is something that, that same thing we we're talking about, the those hallways, conversations within Norwalk, with, I think with actually the, the Jupiter conjunct um, Saturn going into the era element for a new 200 year cycle, mm. I think that in combination to you know what happened with the pandemic and everything, people doing stuff remotely and with the virtual reality coming up, we're gonna start to see perhaps more of those different types of vibes and gatherings where you kind of recreate that, that lobby in between liminal space, the threshold spaces that are in between the places that you're going in to see the the lectures that setting the overall context, but then you are able to, uh, you know, have an invitation to kind of recreate that kind of um, just casual cocktail party. But rather than a bunch of strangers who are interrogating you about the legitimacy of astrology, it's uh, other astrological peeps who are able to really do a deep dives into whatever is emerging. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of you know two things. One, I had done the Denver Astrology Group for ten years, the in-person meetup, and the owner of the Mercury Cafe has been. Pushing me for several months now to like restart it, but I there keep being like these like COVID waves that'll hit, and I wasn't sure if it was time to pack thirty to forty astrologers into a small room together, like breathing on each other for an extended period of time. Um, and you know, there's something appealing to me about the idea of maybe doing a, a local astrology meeting or doing a episode of the astrology podcast that's like in VR that has an audience in VR where you have a Quasi physical component in addition to the the discussion that's taking place between the two of them. Yeah, what I what I would say is that what's interesting or what's the challenge is that a lot of times you take the previous communication media and you replicate it. So like the first uh, radio were, were kind of like theatrical plays, and then the first v or, or or the first radio was like opera, and then into the first uh, TV was like radio plays. And so we're kind of recreating, like putting podcasts within virtual reality, which is something that you can do. But I think part of the real value is the the interactions that you have kind of after the talk. So mm. you're able to kind of have that. So maybe okay. people are watching it on a stream and then they have the after party to be able to kind of like, just like you have the context that's being set by the conversation and people can not have to be in VR for an hour or two to listen to it. And then when they are in VR, they're using all the affordances of VR to be able to actually uh, move around and chat with people and kind of unpack and just decompress all the stuff that was just talked about. Kind of okay. like the, the the same thing of you can do a, a like Norwalk where they have the Zoom conferences where it's better to watch it over Zoom because it's just a better experience to experience the talk. Mm -hmm. And then when it's so that's a one to many broadcast, and then the many to many interactions is where VR really shines. That makes sense. Okay, so yeah, the social because that was totally that's what I said yesterday. I was totally missing from Norwalk, and that was the part during the two. Covid lockdown versions of Norwalk that were completely online that they, that was completely absent and you know one of the things we did after the first one was we saw that and they did the closing ceremony and they're just like all right everyone go home and at a normal Norwalk everyone would go 
to the lobby and hang out and talk at the bar for, like for all, all hours of the night. Right. Um, but it missed that social component, and that would have been a perfect time when something like VR would have been excellent for for being able to replicate some part of that. Yeah. Yeah. The onboarding and making sure you click a button and you get into the right context and the right place with the right people is something that's still getting worked out. But those are the types of issues of like sending out a message that people click on a link and then they put on their headset and they're there. That's where we'll get to eventually. We're not quite there yet. So there's still a lot of In terms thrashing. of how people would find the room. Yeah. Okay. There's different ways of creating private rooms and public rooms. Like when we were going around in VR chat, we were in some public, some private rooms that I had created. But if we were in public rooms, there could have been other people that kind of joined us. But yeah. there's a way of kind of setting the different privacy levels that you want when you're going into these different spaces. So. Okay, cool. So yeah, a lot of possibilities. I'll be interested to continue, you know, interacting with you and wonder once you go fly back later today um, through VR and just exploring some of the different options and possibilities. Uh, more of which I'm sure will become clear once I get more familiar with it. Um, I'm trying to think of other topics before we get to our main topic of artificial intelligence. Was there anything else that's come up this weekend that's been interesting we, to reflect on as we're in this more sort of private, like casual conversation? I think as we go into AI, it'll spread out in other topics like consciousness and the foundations of astrology and quantum computing. You know, there'll be a, a lot, a lot of different sort of associated things. But if we focus on both AI as well as kind of like the role of technology astrology, that'll be a good foundation for us to kind of branch out and talk about other things of that are influencing my own thinking on the topics. Okay. All right. So let's talk about it. So artificial intelligence, and we did bring up a little bit of the distinction because I'd always thought um, artificial intelligence was that that singularity was being used as a synonym at this point for artificial intelligence. But you seem to think that uh, it's not necessarily that those are separate things, or that um, uh, singularity is a potentially more. You, your version, as you explain, it sounds like much more negative than what I've heard, which is often sometimes framed in a more idealistic sense. Well, I think the, the term that's probably best if you wanted to Google and look for more information is uh, artificial general intelligence, meaning that the computing is kind of replicating different aspects of human level of intelligence. So you would be able to interact with virtual beings that have the same type of consciousness that you would expect if you were talking to another person. Hmm. And there's a lot of problems within artificial intelligence, like context is a good example. Like there's no common sense reasoning within artificial intelligence because it's difficult for computers to understand all the relational dynamics that we've learned from a lifetime of experiences of growing up in a culture that we understand at a sub symbolic or unconscious level. Mm -hmm. So there's ways in that the water we're swimming in is our worldviews and our culture that is difficult to articulate even to teach artificial intelligence something like common sense. So there's things that we know from a common sense because of our embodied experiences over a lifetime. Right. But it's a it's a challenge of trying to like take all of those things that are common sense for us and then translate that into uh, some type of computing. And artificial, there's machine learning approaches that are just trying to uh, create those sort of different relational dynamics specifically and say so like being able to identify images or identify language. Those are some examples. But all of those things are going to be coming together into what is eventually what you would see in like modern depictions of AI and like say Westworld where you're talking to characters within the context of a story that you're able to kind of interact with and have intelligent conversations. And then there's a Nick Bolstrom who talks about these concepts of super intelligence, meaning that like you're able to match the humans, but eventually transcend what humans can do into this more um, exponentially increasing amount of intelligence that is like a godlike, omniscient type of intelligence. And what are what are the implications of creating that type of super intelligence, if it, it's even possible? That then, how do humans control something that they can't even fully understand? So that's some of the dilemmas that, when you talk about the singularity, that start to get into that point where you've crossed into this super intelligent realm of artificial intelligence that is more speculative at this point where when you actually talk to a lot of artificial intelligence researchers you know there's a ways in which the there's a disconnect between the philosophical ideas and the, the pragmatic on the ground perspectives of people making it because people making it just tend to be a lot more skeptical about these claims of super intelligence and those claims of you know the potential because they see a lot more of the limitations of ai mm -hmm. so there's a split between the the popular discussions of what we see in the media uh in this mainstream depictions of ai this is much more dystopic vision of ai overlords taking over and killing us all mm -hmm. the terminator uh whereas in like a japanese culture there's different types of uh mythologies and cultures around that what's more in a right relationship where AI is more of this kind of assistant that's serving humanity. And we haven't seen as many stories about that. So our mind tends to go into that more dystopic overlord 
type of mindset. So, and also for me talking to a lot of AI researchers, they just kind of dismiss a lot of those grand claims of superintelligence that are just kind of like hyperbolic and not really grounded into where not only where AI is right now, but also the limits uh, technologically of where AI could go. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're still ways off. Um, and I forgot to mention to ground this conversation, part of why we're having it is one of your other podcasts, you do Voices of Virtual Reality, but you also did a podcast, which is Voices of AI, right? Is that or at one point or is that still ongoing? It was, it's, it's currently offline, but I, I, did, I did probably record somewhere between 230 200 and 300 interviews and then published five. But wow. because I had like the Voices of VR podcast where I've recorded around 1600 interviews and I've published about a, a, over a thousand, mm. it was sort of like I was one of the leading podcasts in VR. And I was worried that if I wanted to try to do that same scale or uh, pace within AI, I was going to sort of diffuse my attention to the point where I was going to not do as good a job on either. So yeah. I kind of focused on VR for a long time and then started other podcasts around mathematics and philosophy and decentralized web technologies, as well as um, some stuff about artificial intelligence and all the other uh, podcasts we talked about a little bit yesterday around uh, sort of more astrological and more esoteric uh, aspects. So there's connections between all of those, but um, the voices of AI, I was able to go to um, some AI conferences and talk to AI researchers, which is kind of nice. informed my own orientation and perspective of not only what the potentials are, but also more of the limits and constraints. Because a lot of times you see a lot of hyperbolic claims about what type of things you could do with AI, which I am skeptical of, but also uh, realizing that it's not really understanding the limits of consciousness or the limits of what technology can do in general. Yeah. Uh, that's wild that you're just walking up to strangers at conferences. Like I, I'm used to it now at astrology conferences with you because it's been become normalized that I forgot probably what that was like both for you initially at the time, but also what it would have been like for people like me that I didn't know you or something. And it was just like a stranger trying to interview you. But that's interesting doing it in a completely like foreign context of like an AI conference where you have all these people working at like super high levels of some of these problems and technology and you're just walking up to people and asking to interview them. Yeah, and so the International Joint Conference of Artificial Intelligence had thousands of different AI researchers from around the world and what I realized was that I was uh, coming up with the limits and understanding the underlying mathematical of pinning underpinnings of the AI. So then I actually the most difficult thing I've ever done was to go to mathematical conferences, the joint mathematics meetings and just walk up to you know what they're from like 3000 different types of mathematicians and to just walk up to a random mathematician and to ask them you know about what math what math branch of math they're working on without knowing anything about that branch of math and so it was probably like the hardest thing i've ever done because it's like trying to understand the underlying language and the uh, I, I started through the philosophy, you know, understanding the philosophy of math and starting there and then getting people's sort of philosophical orientations with mathematics. And then from there, understanding enough about what they were talking about to sort of have them explain the different branches of math. And so it was from that that I, you know, stumbled upon aspects of mathematics like category theory, which is actually much more of like an archetypal approach to mathematics that has been uh, producing a lot of really interesting um, effects. It's like a relational approach to, it's an algebra of relations that is trying to move away from more of a set theoretic approach. But what they're finding is that there's like an explanatory power that is able to do these weird translations from one branch of math to another branch of math. And almost like they've been able to tap into the underlying archetypal potentials of mathematics itself, which is quite an interesting to see how the foundations of math may be moving more towards a category theoretic approach, which has elements of archetypal you know, connections to archetypal cosmologies that, you know, are connected to astrology in a way that most mathematicians are not necessarily thinking about or talking about. But that's because I'm going between all these different realms, there's ways in which that I'm taking those hermetic esoteric insights and then seeing how there's connections, whether it's in AI, virtual reality, or artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, I'm thinking about your chart and you have Gemini rising and it's got to be that, that Mercury Mars conjunction that just gives you the ability to do that, to sort of like thrust yourself into a situation like that of creating a one-on-one -on -one dynamic with a stranger and, and having the sort of like courage to do that in some sense, but also the inquisitiveness and to ask the right questions and things like that. That's certainly a big part of it. And I think also probably a, a bigger part is maybe this, this moon conjunct my Neptune which I think gives me sort of like, I get these- What's your birthday again? Uh, September 1st, uh, 12.05 AM. 76? Yeah, 1976 in uh, Portland, Oregon. Or no, so, so Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay, go ahead with what you're saying. Um, yeah, so I feel like there, I mean, I've had experiences, uh, I, I don't, I haven't talked about this much uh, publicly, but um, 
I would get um, sort of an intuitive insight for who I should talk to next. Like I would be at Norwalk and then be like, you need to talk to Stephen Forrest next. Mm -hmm. And then I would turn around and then walk and I'd know where to go and I'd run into Stephen Forrest. Wow. So there's a certain amount of my process of being embedded within a certain context where I sort of have this really deeply intuitive state where I get into an altered state of consciousness where I focus and meditate on a question that I want to have answered. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I create an intentional field that I run into somebody who has the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I've sort of been able to prove that across all these different domains. Probably the hardest domain I've ever done that is in at these math conferences that are like being able to like run into people and um, have the language to be able to understand what they're saying, but also to have the intention to be able to get the knowledge that I want from them. Um, and I would go to AI conferences and the other conferences and I would have conversations with people and they would think that I was like a PhD in like AI or something. And that's, that, but it's not that I'm, I, I have that. I don't know all the foundations, but I, what I am able to do is understand the language and the larger concepts to be able to have a conversation, to ask the questions that are deeply probing about, you know, the, the philosophical foundations. And I think that's right. my, where my grounding in philosophy helps me to have a philosophical orientation and then be able to jump in between these different contextual domains to be able to have conversations about about a broad range of different topics. That makes sense. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. You bringing up just the Neptune part with the moon Neptune conjunction, that's squaring your sun at eight um, Virgo. And then Mercury, it's not just Mercury Mars conjunction, but also it's conjunct Pluto, and Mercury is actually exchanging signs with Venus. So there's like a sort of mutual reception there. Oh, yeah, and that Jupiter trine, Jupiter in, in Gemini is trining that Mercury pretty closely, which is pretty helpful and supportive as well. And, and Saturn is trining the, the Neptune and the moon as well. So nice. it's giving and it's some a, ground, a little bit of grounding. And it's sextiling, and you know, where the, the Pluto is kind of in the midpoint between my Saturn and my moon Neptune. So it's sort of like a, I don't know. I feel like I I get into like these deeply intuitive states, and a lot of times I have the experience of knowing what question to ask before, and I sometimes I sort of tune into where the, the conversation is going to go. So mm. um, it, it's one of those things where I can't empirically prove any of this stuff. It's more of like maybe when people look back on my body of work, there's something about the what I've been able to do across all these different conversations that maybe will be able to see that there was something that was different than if you were to. Like your approach of being in the 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 Chronos time of kind of planning everything out, mm -hmm. whereas I sort of fully embrace that Kairos being in the in the quality of that moment, and then trying to uh, almost as I walk around, take it as if anything that I'm seeing is like an omen that's trying to tell me something deeper about where to go next or what to see, uh, and then just listening to my body to keep hydrated, and so it was it's very sort of uh, intuitive process. But with that Mars Mercury, I think I'm able to ask the questions and kind of learn on the fly on a lot of ways. Um, are you thinking about going to any of the astrology, either of the astrology conferences this year? I mean, we'll see what happens with Omicron. I may, I may go back to um, Norwalk. I think, but I think I may also focus on just trying to publish a lot of these uh, un, uh, up to this point unpublished podcast uh, conversations. You know, like yeah. um, and getting those out. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say that with virtual reality, I was in the golden era of those conferences that was happening from like 2014 to 2019, and so it's kind of up. Up in the air, I, you know, depending on what the reaction is, if they ever get support for the, the astrological community for relaunching a lot of these up to this point, um, unpublished oral history interviews for the last decade, um, and start to get those out. If I'm able to build up an audience, then I might, you know, make a return to the the lobby of Norwalk. Hmm. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, it would be good to see you running around there again. All right, so back to AI. Um, AI is still at a very early stage. I mean, we one of the things you mentioned to me in private that we didn't mention publicly was, you know, if you were to study the astrology of AI and the important important turning points, then you'd probably want to look at certain alignments like um when the first when Kasparov, the first like chess grandmaster, was beaten by an artificial intelligence, you know, in the mid-90s or the more recent one was when uh, somebody was beat playing that game Go, right? Yeah, AlphaGo and Google. And it started back in like 1956. There was a conference at Dartmouth uh, College. It was a bunch of AI researchers. And at that point, that was what was happening was the um, Uranus square Pluto, I believe, in that, that 50s. And I think there might have also been uh, some connection between um, Saturn and Neptune. Um, there was a, when I was doing a lot of the conversations at AI conferences, there was a Saturn Neptune, you know, in the sky that I was maybe tuning into. There was a lot of hype that was going through. I haven't uh, extensively studied the 
uh, waves of AI. They they talk about within the AI community, there's like the AI winter where things go dark for a long time. And then there's the AI spring and summer where it starts to really explode. Mm. So I was hitting a time that was like the AI summer. Um, and I think now we may be moving into like, there's like monotonic growth that's happening within AI where there's consistent like progress. But sometimes you have these big breakthroughs that just, you know, suddenly, you know, AI is everywhere and there's, you know, you can talk to your phone and there's natural language processing. Uh, I, that, that's been blowing me away, honestly, like how good the voice recognition technology is just on my Android smartphone in the past few years where, because I remember I had I was struggling with issues with like carpal tunnel syndrome in like the, in 2005 and I used a bot, like what was the best program at the time, which is like a dragon speakeasy program. And it was, it was just terrible in terms of recognizing and being able to process and get the right words. Um, but now like something that you carry around in your, in your pocket, in your smartphone can like pretty reliably, like, uh, you know, capture your voice and, and recognize what you're saying, uh, pretty well. Yeah. There's a lot of the machine learning, which, uh, is based upon taking a bunch of data and then basically running it through these processes that are able to discern what the neural network architecture is going to be to be able to recreate that thing that happens within our brain. It's sort of a proxy of how we process information through these layers of neural networks mm -hmm. that are able to make sense of information. And so it's kind of moving from, you know, program where programming what's more linear and then more feeding it at a bunch of data and it's more qualitative un qualitatively understanding what those relationships are to do things like computer vision which is difficult for computers traditionally if you were to just write a heuristic algorithm to do that what you need to do is take a whole bunch of data and then train these neural networks that are able to make those decisions so it's kind of a pivot from those different architectures which actually came up in the 90s or so um but the the difference was the gpu so being able to do parallel processing of all that training information through these uh you know processing units that originally came from video gaming and video was launched in like 1999 or so so it's from an aggregation of all these other associated technologies that as they all come together then it makes new possibilities hmm. so uh, but the challenge though is with alphago as an example um, you're able to do a whole bunch of training of all the different types of, uh, you know, possibilities. But with something like Go, the types of overall possibilities start to exponentially increase to the point where it'd be unfeasible to understand every single po possible move for at any given moment. There's not enough computing power to be able to do that. And so what they had to do is kind of have a, a top-down hierarchical heuristic that was able to organize things and then from there have the bottom-up uh, machine learning approaches. And so it was actually kind of a top-down, bottom-up approach that they did with AlphaGo that was able to achieve that. So I guess when we, you know, a, a met, a, an an example that was given to me by an AI researcher would be like, you could, as a human being, go and read a Wikipedia page for what a bird looks like. And then you can go out and see that bird and you could immediately identify that it was that bird based upon just reading that description. For AI to do that is very difficult mm -hmm. because it, how do you translate that knowledge of what this is and then translate that into the, so that's the more the top down, the language to understand it, mm -hmm. and then uh, train the the perception to be able to understand how to perceive it. Right now, the perception has to have like, it has to see a million pictures of that bird to know it's that bird rather than just give a description of it in order to do that. So there's something about this, this path towards artificial general intelligence that has something about more of those platonic forms of understanding what the, the structures of reality are right. and then how to basically make that translation into the more bottom up approach that we have. And as humans, we do that naturally of having embodied experiences and we have the language to be able to describe that. And we constantly iterate that within the cultural context of growing up and living in a society that everybody around us is helping us to do that. So are there going to be ways to help, you know, train the AI to do that uh, as we move forward? That's really interesting. So the ability of humans maybe to see the archetype underlying something and computers needing to learn that or, or somehow or, or if that's possible. There's something a ways that, you know, they're, they're able to understand the relational dynamics after seeing millions of accounts. But what they can't do is start from the archetypal principle and do that translation. Hmm. And I think that's part of this path towards artificial general intelligence is understanding how to do that computationally. Um, I think there there may be this dimension of human consciousness itself that actually is, 
you know, most people who are neuroscientists are in this mindset of seeing consciousness as a epiphenomena of the brain, you know, kind of reductive materialistically, like it's the, our, our, our phenomenal thoughts are just a, a, re, a response to these brain firings that are then somehow being constructed into our phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. But this is where David Chalmers talks about the hard problem of consciousness of how do you go from these inert bits of matter into what feels like a narrative experience that's all uh, flowing together in a way that all makes sense. Um, you know, and so the limited materialists say, well, consciousness is just an illusion. Uh, it's not actually there. It's just, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're being fooled into believing that we have a phenomenal experience, which kind of denies our, our direct experiences. And so there's other approaches like panpsychism or panexperientialism that is, or even thinking, uh, just in terms of that, there's a layer of consciousness that's fundamental. So there's consciousness that is in this non-spatial temporal realm that somehow is being collapsed into metrical space time into these, you know, from a general relative perspective, a pseudo Raminian structure of uh, 4D space time. But underneath that 4D space time is like this infinite dimension Hilbert space or these non-local fields that go beyond space time. So you look at like ways of uh, non-local interactions at the quantum realm that kind of violate, like, that's what Einstein called this uh, spooky action at a distance where there was things that were happening faster than the speed of light that was happening because you can able to, you're able to entangle particles in a way that at, or are communicating and are connected and correlated to each other at a distance that would uh, go faster than the speed of light, right. which creates these sort of anomalies of the the non-local quantum entanglement that um, sort of goes against that kind of local realism of saying that all of reality is this naturalistic world that's all just space time. But what a lot of the quantum realm is saying that there's these realms beyond space time uh, and those non-local realms. And that's where, you know, process philosophy and these, other interpretations of quantum mechanics, there's not an established universal explanation for a lot of these problems of quantum mechanics that everybody agrees upon, which means that there's a whole wide range of different interpretations. But some of the ones that are more process relational are giving reality to those archetypal potentials, those uh, relational realism or Ruth Kastner's transactional interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics. Or, and Rovelli also has some relational dynamics. But what that means is that there's these underlying potentials of archetypes that uh, Whitehead calls these eternal forms or the platonic forms or the, you know, from an archetypal approach, these are all the archetypal dynamics that are happening at this lower level that's beyond space time. And then at some point that the universe is being constructed moment to moment in what Whitehead calls this moments of concrescence, they're somehow translating from that non-Boolean logic of these realms of archetypal potentials into the more Boolean logic of true, false, um, and more binaries of something that kind of collapses into the actual realities. So it's almost like the archetypal potentials of these multifaceted diamonds, and then somehow when it happens, only one of those potentials are actualized. So the difference between the potential and the actual is something that is a debate within the sort of quantum ontology, but also in general, uh, like substance metaphysics denies those potentials. They say they're basically an artifact of a quantum phenomena that is decohering and it doesn't, it's basically you ignore it. So their, their reaction to those dimensions of potential is to just ignore that they're not there. But there could be elements of both consciousness. And as we move forward, the ways in which that even understanding how astrology works from that process relational approach that gives a more of a mechanistic explanation for what may be happening at these lower levels. But this, this gets into discussions when you talk about consciousness and talk about AI and the limits of what, you know, is AI going to be able to do some of these things that maybe human beings have their consciousness that they have just, uh, they're swimming in these archetypal potentials and we just are able to somehow understand the language in a way that we just learn language really fast because it's something about the human brain that when we're in the context and hearing it, then we're able to acquire all that language in a way that it goes above and beyond what they're able to replicate in the, in the artificial intelligence technologies. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I mean, it even takes humans a while to learn, you know, language as as babies, and you start very basic, and then you build up over the years, and it gets more complicated and stuff. And I, I don't know. I go back and forth because I could see that going either way in terms of that being something that you hit a wall at some point with artificial intelligence where you can't go further or you don't and eventually it's just a problem that's overcome and then it's able to progress to and replicate the same process that humans do at some point but going back to that in terms of defining what even artificial intelligence is and what would qualify for it what was the the turing test right well, there was a Turing test, um, but the Turing test is a little outdated because of okay. all the advances. And so, could you uh, explain what it was originally? Yeah, the Turing test was 
that you would sit down at a computer and then you have either a human on the other side chatting with you or you'd have a bot that was chatting with you and you had to determine whether or not you were talking to a real human or you were really talking to artificial intelligence that was tricking you into believing that they were human. Mm -hmm. So the Turing test was for this kind of chat bot interactions to allow you to see whether or not um, the the AI was able to basically replicate um, human interactions. Yeah, which is you know fair enough, or seems, and that was introduced by like Alan Turing in, Turing in the nineteen forties or fifties. I think so. I don't know the exact date. Uh, I've, it's been it's been these. a number of years since I've really dove into the AI stuff, and so. Um, it's Tur I N G because I think we have his birth time. I don't know if I have it in this database. Yeah, what what I would say is that um, when I was uh, going to AI conferences, AI Magazine in two thousand sixteen actually had released a a whole magazine that was talking about the Turing test for the 2050. So they were they were projecting out and saying, you know, by 2050, what are the different types of things that we would expect AI to be able to do that it can't do now to be able to, you know, set this bar to say like if it's able to achieve that, then we're on this path towards, you know, more of this artificial general intelligence ideas. Right. So there's a set of different types of tests that are the kind of the next generation Turing tests that go above and beyond uh, the Turing test right now, because with GPT-3, it's able to basically create a language model uh, from OpenAI and other folks that do a pretty good job of replicating different aspects of the Turing test where you, you, you would talk to it, but it's like basically scraping all different aspects of the internet and training a, a language model on top of that. And it's yeah. basically replicating what the cultural aggregate of what what you would expect someone to say based upon something, but it's not actually have a deliberate intention or a character or a personality behind it. It's just a, a, re a regurgitation of an aggregate sociological um, con condensation of a lot of cultural thought based upon scraping millions of different websites. Yeah. So that's the problem with the Turing test is that you could legitimately at this point probably even trick somebody into thinking that they're talking with a human um, you know, the AI could get that good at least in terms of conversational stuff, but Behind it, um, it doesn't still necessarily have consciousness or choice or other things like that, so that it's still not, in terms of AI actually replicating human consciousness, it's just one step in terms of being able to almost like fool a human into having the presentation of that. Yeah, there's two two I think angles to that issue, which is the first angle is just as you were saying, engaging with what it would feel like to talk to another human. And where it's starting a lot of this stuff is within the context of these story worlds. So you'd be in the context of a story and interacting with a, a non-player character, a virtual being. And in the context of the story, you're able to basically do the different types of interactions that would be impossible if it was just a general context, you know, the artificial general intelligence. So in the context of a game world or a story world, so just you know, think as an example, Westworld, where you go into that, that town and you're able to have conversations, they're able to understand enough about that world and kind of code that into those virtual beings to the point where they're able to kind of trick you even more into believing that the that AI virtual being is more intelligent than it actually is. But they're able to kind of shortcut a lot of those contextual domains because they're controlling that within the context of a game or a story. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the development within these virtual beings are happening in the context of these story worlds. But if you talk about generalized intelligence, if you just throw AI out into the world, uh, because it doesn't identify context or, or common sense reasoning, it's a lot difficult, more difficult to do those different types of things that a human would be able to do. But um, so they're able to kind of shortcut a lot of stuff by looking at it in the context of games and stories. Gotcha. Um, so here's, I found it, we do have a birth time for him. And interestingly, is another Gemini rising like yourself. So Alan Turing, um, so it's June 23rd, 1912, 2.15 AM in London, five Gemini rising, ruler of the ascendant is Mercury, which is in Cancer in the second house conjunct the sun and co-present with Neptune. It's got a Venus Pluto conjunction in the first house and Jupiter on the descendant in Sagittarius in the seventh, and Uranus smack dab on the midheaven in Aquarius at two degrees. And um, yeah, Mars in Leo, Moon in Libra, and Saturn in Taurus. So I guess um, Wikipedia says that the Turing test was introduced, he came up with it in 1950. So in terms of like 1950s, you know where the technology was then like yeah like you know being tricked into having a conversation with a computer uh would be really impressive but like now we're at the point where it's not a sufficient litmus test so what are some of the other tests that have been sub suggested in terms of at the point at which ai is is getting there 
I think one of them uh, is the sort of Winograd schema, which was trying to understand like contextual puns as you speak. Uh, you understand as humans what things mean, but you know some things are just difficult for AI to understand. So there's language things that um, I think generally, like common sense reasoning is another thing where there's contextual things that we just know because of our embodied experiences, but are harder for AI to figure out. I mean, that, I run into that all the time on Twitter with, there's so many different people that follow me from around the world at this point that I sometimes like I'll make jokes on Twitter or something or, or use a turn of phrase or something, but there'll be people from other languages that don't understand the subtle like nuances of some in joke in English and and won't get it. So I could see that as being an issue you would run into with AI for similar reasons. Yeah. And there there's other other topics like zero shot learning. Like I said, you know, you give a, a language description and then it's able to do it some sort of computer vision task. And so bridging those different things, kind of as a metaphor, the left brain and right brain, how the 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 left brain is the language center that makes these conceptual uh, you know frameworks of understanding our experience. And then the the right brain is more of the undifferentiated realm of different embodied experiences. Um, I feel like there's different ways of manipulative intelligence, uh, social intelligence, emotional intelligence that kind of match over some of the the elemental framework. I found that models of talking about intelligence such as emotional intelligence as an example or manipulative intelligence would be kind of the agency aspect or or just the conceptual intelligence and also the embodied intelligence is a lot about robots so one of the things is like will robots be able to play soccer in 2050 in a way that is matching the same level of uh skill and competition that humans have so we'll be seeing like soccer playing, which is- um, I mean, probably, honestly, like some of the Boston Dynamics robots are going, are advancing super fast. Well, the robots the, 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 with themselves, but then there's other things that'll be multi-party uh, dimensions of coordinating between multiple robots working with each other, right. but also uh, the defense. So there's offense and defense. Right. So s robots playing soccer ends up being a lot of really juicy, like, you know, uh, AI problems of, of multi-party coordination, but also- sensing the, the realm, but also just the robot technology in general of, you know, having a humanoid robots running around kicking a soccer ball, uh, playing against each other in a competition. So yeah, they've been doing things as you've been watching it progress from like doing parkour and gymnastics types of things, you know, it starts to get to the point where, you know, the, and the, those dogs, which had the whole Black Mirror episode of, you know, robot dogs going around as a security dogs killing people. So hmm. it, it's uh, I'll, some of that stuff, I think it, we get into the same, you know, kind of Terminator mindset of like having these AI overlord robots that once they're embodied, then it's different than having interactions with AI within the context of a virtual world, which actually is kind of like potentially going to be a neutral place to be able to engage with AI in a way that may be safe for our physical reality. Right. So, you know, engaging with these uh, AI entities within the context of virtual worlds means that they can only, they can't sort of do physical harm to us, like if they were embodied within a robot, as an example. So yeah, um, so starting to think about things of that that point, like getting far into the future about some of the inevitabilities, like robots playing soccer and some of those things like that. One of the things I've thought, like like ten years ago, that'll come up at some point in the future is like once AI progresses to a certain point, one of the like interesting social problems that I know is going to happen at some time in our future of humanity is going to be. A social issue of like humans having relationships with AI, uh, like romantic relationships, and the like appropriateness or inappropriateness of that from a societal standpoint. Because some of the same arguments about about whether it's like quote unquote natural or or unnatural that have you know sometimes people try to argue about in recently when it comes to the shifts in society with same sex relationships over the past century or something like that will probably come up again in that context. Or it's something I thought about, or you can kind of anticipate coming up at some point in the future. Yeah, the movie Her really dives into a lot of that, so, right? As a, as a story to kind of um, talk about that. And there's a, a piece that was a, a art piece that was showing at Sundance, I think 2019 or 2020. It's called Jester's Tale by Asad J. Malik, and the experience was kind of a Turing test of the next generation, where um, you know when you take on when you interact on the internet, you have to you know fill out all these captchas and to prove that you're not a robot. Mm. So how would that evolve over time? And so this was an augmented reality experience that was having you interact with this, it was a pre-recorded hologram of a volumetric boy. And it was 
kind of like giving you this narrative. And the Turing test was to see how you were reacting as a human as to what type of reactions you may have as you're interacting with these, uh, you know, kind of holograms. But at the end of the piece, what they did was they actually had a child actor, they opened up a door and there was a child actor in a cage. And the provocation was, uh, okay, as you, in the context of passing this Turing test, are you going to kill yourself or are you going to kill this little boy that's here? So it's almost like, and the point that Asad was trying to make was that with AI, as we move forward, we're going to have these virtual beings that are kind of hacking into our social um, the, uh, millions of years of uh, or how many, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution of how we deal with social dynamics. Hmm. And when you start to embody these virtual beings, then they can start to hack those those kind of affordances of how we treat other humans as just part of you know being a kind human. But you can start to manipulate people through having them do things that would be against their best interest. In this case, it was having you kill yourself instead of killing this boy. Hmm. There was a real boy child actor, but it was you know metaphorically representing this AI being that you know you had to make this moral choice in that moment. Hmm. Um, and I I chose to kill myself rather than the boy. And then as I was thinking about it, it's like oh well, that's kind of like an interesting provocation that you know even I in that in the context of that story world in that moment of making that choice chose to sacrifice myself rather than. You know, of course, I'm not going to actually die, but you know, the point was is that you can make choices that are against your interests when you have virtual beings that are trying to manipulate and control you in different ways. Mm, okay. Um, let's see. So bringing it back to astrology, I mean, one of the problems is always is going to be consciousness and like what is consciousness and can consciousness that we experience as humans be replicated in machines or in programs? And um, if so, how and what is the model going to be of that? And one of the interesting things that was happening at one point at Project Hindsight was there was like this secret project where part of the premise was that astrology could be a model for consciousness that could be useful in developing AI, basically. And I forget what they called it. And that's, you know, defunct at this point, which is the only reason I'm okay mentioning it. But I always thought that was an interesting thing or could be interesting direction to take things because that's going to be one of the fundamental issues that they're wrestling with over the next few decades is like how to create consciousness or how to replicate consciousness in machines but that's an interesting question of could astrology be used as a is it already there like do we already have a model of consciousness that's like 2000 years old at this point that could somehow be used in a way that's useful for replicating it artificially yeah, there's three big topics that that sort of taps into. One is the philosophy of mind and consciousness itself and how to describe it in those discussions. Then there's the realms of potential and the limits of technology of understanding how to deal with potential, which we talked about yesterday with the you know archetypal predictions versus concrete predictions. And then the third aspect is um, the realms in which that you're able to use a whole wide range of existing psychographic profiling of taking a whole wide range of different information. But the whole challenge is, is telling the story of what that information means in terms of a reflection of your character. So one of the things that astrology does do is give like almost a mathematical description of a higher order story for the unfolding of your life, mm -hmm. uh, where you're at right now and where you're going in the future. Right. And part of the challenge of modeling mathematically, you know, humans are not mathematical entities that could be modeled deterministically. There's, there are always going to be things that are go above and beyond. I mean, that's a question though, isn't it? Because that's actually something I've found really fascinating is I feel like um, in a lot of mainstream philosophy, I guess it's in more of the physics or philosophy of physics side, it seems like there's a shift towards determinism in some of the high-level physicists at this point? Well, that's because they are into substance metaphysics that they believe that all space-time is a 4D man manifold that has already all happened. Mm. You know, Einstein led to this block model, model of the universe where all space-time, where time is spatialized into, time is like transformed into a spatial dimension of 4D. So space-time is one metric where space and time are connected. And if you go down that route of looking at a general relativistic mathematical model, you will say that all space and time has already happened and that we're just these deterministic beings that are unfolding and these habits that we don't actually have any intentional actions. Which but, ultimately almost takes you back to stoicism in some way where their premise was just like each cause, everything has a cause and, and there, whatever happens has a cause preceding it. And if you take the full chain of causality all the way back to the beginning, it all goes back to one singular cause and then everything else that comes after that then must be um, predetermined already as a result of that chain of causation, which is part of what they called fate. So anyway, it's just in terms of moder a modern version of Stoicism, but that goes back to something pretty ancient. 
Yeah, and what, what I would say is that I do believe that there is probably some weird combination of fate and free will that we don't fully understand, so that there are these math structures that are somehow you know collapsing into something that are bounded with what Tarnas would say, uh, archetypally predictive, but not concretely predictive. So there's a range of potentials, but we don't know how that is that potential is going to be actualized into the specifics. That's why I think them, uh, if you look at the, the discussions within physics, there's currently no way to uh, meld the mathematical structure of general relativity with the mathematical structures of quantum realities. And so- But so you're saying that's true though. It is true that there's, is my perception true that there's a tend towards determinism in f modern philosophy of physics at this time? Well, it depends on what philosophy of physics you're talking about. If you're talking about quantum ontology, then no. Okay. If you're talking about like general relativity, then, but most of the philosophy folks are looking at physics are not d that way. They may have practitioners of physics that are, but they may be in the realm of kind of discounting different aspects of how to match what they're doing at the large scale with the small scale. So right now, physics has not matched the small with the large. So the quantum realms are a different math structure than the general relativity. And what they suspect is that the uh, that the metrical space-time is emergent out of that quantum potentia. So the infinite dimension, Hilbert space, or whatever math structure is going to be larger of, of it's what um, Timothy Eastman has referenced, uh, Hans Primus, who has identified it as a set of non-Boolean logics. So these, these realms of potential that then somehow out of that um, collapse into metrical space-time. And that's what quantum loop gravity and other systems that are trying to understand the structures of reality. In order to get the metric space time, you have to start with the quantum realities. And the quantum realities then somehow get translated and you have kind of like a non-Boolean logic that get projected into a Boolean logic. So uh, metaphorically, that's uh, within the quantum measurement problem, it's the quantum wave function that has all these realms of potential, but there's a question as to whether or not that wave function is collapsing and how it's collapsing and why it's collapsing, or if it is even collapsing. The, the people that are kind of in the realm of seeing all of these deterministics, they're probably a fan of the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that every potential possibility is actualized in a parallel reality that we can't see. So imagine if you're going through a Saturn transit, just as an example to bring it back to astrology, and you can imagine that uh, you've experienced every single possible dimension of that Saturn transit in a parallel reality, and the one that you're experiencing now just happens to be the one that you've forked off of your consciousness that you're aware of. Right, but, but there, there's many different dimensions, and there's like a version where you made one choice, and there's a version where you made the other choice, and all of those are existing sort of simultaneously. Simultaneously, but you can't, you have no way of interfacing those. Maybe there's sort of like the different ways in which maybe those realities are bleeding over with each other, which, you know, is more speculative, but that's a, a version of reality where every single possibility is actualized. And that's the Everett's mini world interpretation of quantum mechanics. Okay. But that is not what uh, a more of a process relational approach or Whitehead's approach. What Whitehead says is that there is a realm of potential and that there's an actuality and that there's this phase of manifestation that goes through prehension and eventually this concrescence to the point where there's almost a, all those concresting waves come up and when they combine together, almost like sort of the metaphor of those harmonic frequencies, as you were talking about with Rick Levine, that and, and through those different planetary aspects, that when those combine together, then somehow they manifest into something that becomes from the possible to the actual. Um, and that's where the relational quantum mechanics, as well as the Ruth Kastner's transactional quantum mechanics, puts ontological reality to those uh, quantum potentials where most of the modern physics denies those potentials as not being real because it just gets actualized into these parallel dimensions that we can't see. So either way, there's a metaphysical assumption you have to make. And mm -hmm. the people who are kind of more on the realm of metaphysics or the substance metaphysics like that as a Everett because the, it allows them to kind of deny the reality of potential. Mm -hmm. And most of the astrological tradition is all about exploring potentials. And so because of the substance metaphysics, it's sort of the astrology doesn't make sense within the assumption, metaphysical assumption of, of substance metaphysics. It makes a lot more sense if you make the assumption of process relational metaphysics, meaning that the underlying building blocks of all of reality, you can use either processes or relationships to be able to describe everything else out of reality. Yeah. Um, so, but going back, I mean, there is a sort of determinism built into and that is inherent in astrology that is greater than both should happen if you don't know that astrology exists and that the fundamental premise of astrology, I've, I've always said, is that there's a correlation between celestial movements and earthly events, but the premise of natal astrology does imply there's some level of determinism in our lives in that 
The alignment of the planets the moment of your birth should not be able to say anything about the nature and course of your life or, or who you are or what you do as an adult. Um, and yet it does for some reason, and therefore it must have some inherent predict predictive power, predictive capability. And I'm okay with that being archetypal to a certain extent, but that's um, in saying that it's archetypally predictive, but it might go further even than Tarnus is sometimes willing to go because he's limiting and reducing the timing techniques that he's using or open to to a certain extent to only the most general ones. And when you start looking at all the timing techniques that are actually available to astrologers and the types of different things that they can do, it does seem like it starts narrowing down things a little bit more in terms of how much more deterministic things might be from an astrological standpoint than you might otherwise think. Yeah, I mean this I mean it's a good question, a good point of just even those timing techniques and I've thought a lot about, you know, what is the metaphysical uh rationale for why those work and what's going on there. And what I've come to believe, I guess is I guess I go back to like Aristotle had the four causes. Uh, and two of the causes are used in like sort of modern cosmology and two have been ignored for many hundreds of years. So the ones that are used existing for substance metaphysics orientations is material causality and efficient causality. Material causality is like when you're kind of banging physical stuff against each other and it's it's bouncing and it's interacting. And there's uh, efficient cause is like I am the actor that is causing something to happen. So when we talk talk about causation, it's usually in the existing cosmology, you know, or the sort of you know reductive materialism or physicalism or naturalism. It's like there are some sort of like things you can point to that are causing one thing there or next. But with the sort of modern turn towards complexity sciences, sometimes there's these processes that are like feedback loops where things kind of like are um, almost like these uh, cellular automata is a mathematical metaphor that uh, like you kind of like set out some simple rules and as you play it out, then things just kind of like unfold in a way that gives a level of complexity. It seems like there's something that is causing it, but it's really just a set of simple rules that are kind of interacting with each other. But to get back to the uh, other two causes that Aristotle laid out, he laid out the final causation and the, the formal causation. The final causation is like the purpose or the intent, um, and it, it's the, also referred to as the teleological impulse. So there's something that's pulling something towards a specific end goal. Right. The, I, the telos. I, the telos, yeah. And I feel like that the natal chart embedded into it has some sort of degree of final causation. Right. Well, and, and that's. You know, in astrology, some of the astrologists like Ptolemy's text was titled Apotelosmatics, the study of outcomes or the study of ends. And that was one of the words for astrology is apotelesma, which means like the the end or the result of something. And it uses that root word of telos. Mm, yeah, that's that's perfect. So yeah, and I think that um, there's so many aspects of the natal chart being the ground context for all these other processes. You always go back to the natal chart as right. like the underlying context. And then there's other things that are um, what Whitehead would talk about, these sort of nested sets of context or myriology of these holes and parts. And so ast astrology itself is, um, you know, the, the math structure of process are these structures. And so in astrology, you look at the natal chart as the underlying context, and then you may look at zodiacal releasing as like these longer, uh, uh, or Zef was it the uh, uh, Zephyria, what's her, the, uh, or the, the other one from, um, What's the other like some long periods? Perfections of, or per, there's perfections for for years, but then there's other techniques that the it's like planetary periods. There's um, decennials. There's you know Fredaria is always, Fredaria, yeah. Fredaria, okay. Fredaria. So Fredaria has like these longer, and so you can sort of go through like understanding what to look at in terms of the hierarchy of things that are influencing someone. You look at the the natal chart and then the maybe the progressions and transits, and depending on what your own ordering is, is going to detect di dictate how you make astrological delineations. Right. Um, but um, that's where I think it gets into the formal causation, which is those math structures, and somehow those math structures of planetary periods are somehow tied between the structure at which um, you know Aristotle, when he talked about time, he talked about things relative to each other. It's like the um, number. So number is uh, representing change over time. So a metaphor is how the planets are re changing relative to each other. So the the Earth around the Sun gives us the uh, the diurnal rotation gives us the day around the 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 you know around the well, full rotation gives us a year, and then the Moon gives us like the month. And so as you look at those relative uh, changes between those, then you can start to see um, you know the planetary period for Venus. There's 
eight revolutions of the sun for every 13 revolutions of Venus. And so it's a way of matching how those relative time is moving uh, to each other, but yet at the same time, it's also moving through the zodiac. So the zodiac and, but also the spatial movement through um, the, uh, through, through, through space creates a ratio of, of eight to 13, which creates these five retrograde cycles. Um, but because of that, as you know, Venus is in retrograde, like, you know, moving into this cycle right now, it, 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 there's something about the structure of that to be able to correlate the movement of things through space-time and through the zodiac that is able to correlate the the chronos time of things moving through a period that is can be measured and the kairos which is the quality of it which represents the things that you get from the archetypal dynamics from the zodiac so there's something about the planetary periods that are able to kind of bridge the gap between the chronos and the kairos time in a way that melds those two things together. And mm -hmm. so when I've started, like really tried to figure out what is it about those planetary periods that make it so special, it's because it's moving through space time, but it's also moving through a symbolic sort of space of the zodiac that has these representation of the archetypal potentials. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's still a question around whether or not uh, we'll ever get to the point to be able to collapse the realms of potentials into the actuals in a concrete way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about that because I sometimes think about that in terms of how to do sit down at the consultation and do a delineation. And one of the models I came up with was with when you're sitting with somebody to explain the archetype, but you you can't really ever explain the archetype fully of like, let's say, a placement or a combination that you're looking at. So what you can do is you can explain three different like version. You can attempt to explain the higher level archetype as best you can using general language, but then you can explain like a positive manifestation of that. Um, a challenging or negative manifestation of that, and then something in between that's kind of like in between or neutral as a way to attempt to describe the archetype of that. And then the astrologer ends up having to ask how they've experienced it so far, if they have it all uh, in their life. There's something about astrologers in the moment of astrology that Jeffrey Cornelius talks about that is able to collapse those realms of potential and then maybe even get it dead on in a way that is able to to land in a way that someone hears it and it exactly resonates in a way that they exactly need to hear at that moment. And I feel like that's sort of the process of what astrology is, that astrologers train themselves to be able to do that, collapsing of those potentials into the actuals through the process of talking to people and understanding the context and understanding what may be something that unlocks these deeper ideas about what these structures of reality of the character as it's unfolding that helps them identify to not only their story, but also the larger contextual dynamics of the world around them and how they relate to it. So I do think that there is something very special about that, that astrologers have that I don't know if we'll ever get there to that point uh, with uh, existing computing technology as it stands today with, with, AI. The, with yeah. AI, with the caveat that maybe there's something about quantum computing that we, that most people that are quantum computer folks are not thinking about it in terms of these more esoteric, hermetic, you know, archetypal realities that are giving reality to those potentials. But there is something interesting that with quantum computing, is there a way in which that our intentions and our actions that are happening at a consciousness level are subtly in influencing those realms of potential that are able to be collapsed into actuals in a way that like maybe a quantum computing AI and we'll be able to recreate what the experience of seeing an astrologer is going to be Whereas like classical computing won't because it has more of a, a binary approach of ones and zeros that don't deal with non-Boolean logics in the same way that quantum computing might. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about that. So, well, first though, I mean, astrologers can get it wrong. Like you can be in a consultation, you can say something wrong. So we have Absolutely, to be yeah. a little careful because the even astrologers are, are fallible. And that's honestly the biggest shortcoming of astrology ultimately. And that's always been one of the main things astrologers have talked about for 2,000 years in terms of sometimes when astrology doesn't work is the astrologer being capable of making a bad call or making the wrong call or misinterpreting things or whatever. Um, so that's a thing. But in terms of astrology and AI, you know, it's even earlier, earlier days and we have very little so far, like currently the state of things in ter terms of astrology and computing is just there are programs like astro.com, for example, that have been around for 20 years where you can get a delineation from them where it'll spit out like a report that'll interpret a bunch of different placements, either let's say in your birth chart or in your transits in isolation. And you can get a pre written thing of like Pluto in the seventh house means this, or Mercury in 
the second house means this, but none of those programs at this point will synthesize it. And synthesis is really of the dis different placements is really the thing that's missing so far that nobody's pulled off or, or attempted to pull off. And that's one thing that you really, at this point in time, need a human astrologer for is to synthesize all of the different placements or at least to attempt to. Yeah. And I think we're going to be in that place for a long, long time. I think it's been a, a, a long time and maybe never that we'll get to the point where some of the competing technologies will be able to match what astrologers are able to do. Because uh, there may be some things about the intuitive process of astrology that goes above, above and beyond what logic could model. I mean, back at the turn of the century when uh, Alfred North Whitehead and uh, Bertrand Russell were trying to translate all of the basis of mathematics into logic, that project failed. Uh, it failed because there were certain liar paradoxes in the way that um, it's, it's sort of like impossible to, to put all of the foundations of mathematics onto logic. And for Bertrand Russell, he went off and kind of started aspects of the analytic tradition that still can carried forth that dream of that logical positivism or the the dream of having everything based upon logic. But Whitehead was liberated from that dream of thinking that all things could be you know figured out with logic because as a mathematician, he realized that there were aspects of intuition that went above and beyond could, that uh, that could be explained with logic. And so he sort of drove him to think of other aspects of how maybe there's what what led to him being more of a pan experientialist meaning that all the basis of reality is experience and then on top of that if you focus on that aesthetics and those feelings and those emotions and those aspects of your embodied experiences then from there that's the most important thing um and that led to his you know kind of process relational approach of his metaphysics that he created an entire new fit metaphysics because as a mathematical physicist he didn't like how uh, einstein was spatializing time and he disagreed uh with you know einstein and Ber bergson had a debate around time uh and it was a very influential debate and uh bergson was you know he was talking about these concepts of, of duration which in essence, we're talking about these, you know, more qualitative aspects of time and this our, our direct phenomenological experience of time. And that with Einstein's approach, it was sort of eliminating that and sort of eliminating the Kairos and only focusing on the Kronos. There were things that Bergson got wrong in terms of the time, you know, the liar or the the time travel paradox. But uh, Whitehead came in and kind of like was inspired by that, and then you know drove him to eventually led to him making this sort of process relational metaphysics with the insights of quantum realities that he saw that you know the basis of these math structures that Einstein was using were not robust enough to really cover what was happening in the quantum realm, which led him to you know, make these more radical metaphysical approaches that were saying that all the basis of reality were these processes and relationships. And from there, you construct, can construct all of the nature of reality out of that. And so it started with him like having a, a doubt of everything being based on logic and seeing that there is these other aspects of, of intuition and feeling that were kind of at the, the more core part of our uh, experience, which doesn't create this bifurcation of the mind and body, which the substance metaphysics does. For panpsychism, that a lot of the work that he started, it says that there's bits of consciousness in every bit of of every atom, and that as that pulls together, that's somehow being combined into our uh, degrees of consciousness. So, so rather than having our phenomenal consciousness come out of this dead matter, that there's actually more of an enchanted elements of consciousness uh, into every piece of these smaller processes. Yeah, I mean, uh, for an AI guy or so that does the VR podcast or AI podcast or did an AI podcast, you're, you seem much more skeptical of the ability of AI to go to a certain point or evolve to a certain point when it comes to astrology than I would expect. And I, I feel more like it's a, more of an open question. I could I could see computer programs being developed that could synthesize placements pretty well. Um, up to a certain point, but certainly way better than they do now because there's just there's almost been like no steps towards that at this point because it's not a problem a lot of software companies have even tried to wrestle with. Um, but it makes me think so in part of your response to that though it makes me think as a counterpoint something like what if you know for example in the the matrix part of the setup of in the first two matrixes there was like a logical, you know, the architect of the matrix, they like created two very logical versions of the matrix, but they didn't work out because like humans didn't accept them. But then there was uh, an intuitive program or program that was designed to be more intuitive that came up with the version that did take when they gave people choice, even if they only had that choice at a unconscious level. But um, there is a question for me: what if, what if there could be some sort of program that could develop intuition or could be designed in order to understand whatever the component of intuition is? It seems like you're taking that off the table as a possibility of something that 
um, machines could never achieve, or that's only a property of humans? Well, I guess the part of the reason that that skepticism is is coming out of uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem that came out of the work of Principia Mathematica. Uh, so, in that effort of trying to translate everything down to logic, they they realized they couldn't do that. And part of that was uh, led to what Gödel realized was that there's a fundamental incompleteness for any sort of formal system that you can either be one of two things. You can be consistent or complete, but you can't be both. You have to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that for any system that you have, so any computer program that you try to do, you're able to reveal some information, but you're always going to have some information that's occluded from you that you don't understand, that's going to be left out because there's a fundamental incompleteness to the nature of these different types of systems that you try to create. So if you understand the girdle incompleteness reality, then it, it leads to that sort of both skepticism of creating a technologically deterministic system that's able to describe all the nature of reality, as an example, um, or if that tried to encompass all of astrology, or even astrology is incomplete, there are things that astrology can't handle. So there's an incompleteness to astrology, but there's also an incompleteness of any program that tries to describe astrology, because there's there's going to be things that are be in that are true within that system that you can't prove that are true within that system, and that's what Gödel basically mathematically proved. Um, so there's ways in which that that's in the realm of logic and the realm of math, but I'm sort of making a math uh, sort of a metaphor for how astrology is actually very similar to mathematics and the structures of mathematics. And if we look at the philosophy of mathematics, then we can start to see sort of the limits of what astrology can do, but also the limits of computation and the limits of what we can do with trying to model things, mm -hmm. because the the maps these are creating symbolic maps of reality, but the, there's a difference between the map and the territory. And there's things within the territory that you're never able to fully understand from a conceptual level and then be able to en encompass within a logical system, which also encompasses that sort of girdle incompleteness. So there's going to be things about our direct embodied experiences that we have day to day that we can't even put language to. That's another example of how our experience is so much richer to than the language that we have that we can describe it. And that's why uh, Whitehead has this fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is that we think about when we come up with the language and the description and the models of things that those become the things. But there's actually more that is not included within those models of that language that we haven't been able to encompass. And human experience is always greater than those ways of describing it. So astrology is a language describing the human experience, but can never really fully describe the full richness of the human experience. There's always going to be a gap between the quality of what the direct experience is and what the, the model of reality is saying. Which which is right. the, so there's a there's a danger of thinking of astrology as uh, the the fallacy of misplaced misplaced concreteness that that is the real that is the, that the map is the territory, mm -hmm. but it's just a map. It's not the territory. All right. Well, this is making me want to take this on as a challenge, not because I have a hardcore conviction that uh, you could build a computer that could eventually do delineations as good as humans, but I think the level of of synthesis of of actual like ai usage or or synthesis machine synthesis in astrology right now is so pitifully behind and like underdeveloped that we could like definitely get way beyond where we are now in terms of having computer generated reports that like do provide some basic synthesis of placements or even just provide some possibilities of like positive outcome negative outcome neutral outcome based on past you know events that have been experienced by people that had the same placements i mean that's all stuff that could be programmed it's more of a challenge of collecting all the data and inputting it than it is um that actually being a possibility so i think i think we could get to that point that's making me want to like take on the challenge of like developing a program that would do that cuz i've been thinking about Developing an app as well as developing a software program that could run on the computer that would do things that the current programs like Solar Fire that was designed 20 years ago can't and still very much look like they're from the 90s, especially with the user interface. But that could be one specific motivation or reason why to develop that program and what I would want to accomplish in doing so that would set it apart from others. Yeah, I think my orientation to those things is that I think you're right in the way that there there is certainly advancements that can happen. Uh, and then at the same time, I think once those advancements happen, then the humans will be able to build on that and then do things that the computer still can't do. Right. Um, as an example, I think of like a technique like zodiacal releasing as an example. Like if someone comes in and gets a reading about zodiacal releasing, you're not, they're not able to basically efficiently communicate their entire life story and their biography that fits into some math structure of what the planetary periods at the L1, L2, L3, and L4 are. 
know, but imagine AI is able to do that, kind of pay attention to uh, listening to, you know, this is gets into the very creepy area of a technology where what degree of, are you willing to give over your, your agency and your privacy over to these things that are tracking this? Mm -hmm. But let's say for the sake of the argument that we have a benefic AI that you're in control of that's able to track these things in a way that's trying to help you rather than surveil you or control and manipulate you, which is how right. most of the time is. But if we do have a way in which that um, we're able to capture those deeper contextual dimensions, uh, I think we're, I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably be leading into a realm where um, rather than having an ast astrologer give all those delineations, it may be presenting all this information to give a presentation of that information for people to make their own intuitive judgments about these different patterns in their life. Um, and that I can see uh, a way in which, like just an example of taking photos, just imagine all the different photos you've ever taken on your phone. And if you were able to apply a series of different, you know, timing techniques astrologically, and you could say, you could open your phone right now and you say, oh my gosh, this moment right now is connected to this, you know, you know, cycle that happened, you know, at a Venus cycle eight years ago or Mercury cycle, you know, 20 years ago or mm. sun cycle 19 years ago or Mars cycle 15 years ago or any quadrature aspect of those. And so like a, you know, a square to that um, or uh, maybe not a, uh, quadrature but you know with these different phases there's you know the the retrograde cycle of, of venus as an example of like the last retrograde cycle if however way you break those up that's know. a really good example actually because like something um you can input like your emails i have like 20 25 years of of gmail 20 years of gmail not 20 15 years of gmail at this point and like with the venus retrograde cycles like having a program that could like scan all of your emails and and ask what was happening eight years ago when Venus was retrograde in that sign, and it comes back and it says it looks like you're going through a breakup at that time. Uh, right. <laughs> like that, that would be helpful in a way that could give you a shortcut to researching astrology using some sort of machine learning or program. Um, but yeah, that we're we're still you're then taking that judgment that it, that's not a judgment. You're the one making the judgment, but it's able to process data more faster than than maybe you can on your own. Yeah, and I think we're going to be moving into that realm where we're as more of the sort of uh, fluency in the astrological language and the, the power of being able to look at these different things. We, we're not at the point of being able to have those different ways of doing those big, vast machine learning AI ways of dumping in all of our data that then can then be processed to allow us to find some mode of being able to navigate the underlying mathematical structures of our lives or the archetypal dynamics and the cycles of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that being able to lead to uh, insight, not as an in, in individual, but imagine if astrologers are able to become fluent and they are able to enter in a virtual world that has access to all these things. And you're able to walk through the structures of someone's lives and be able to make delineations based upon empirical evidence that's been gathered at specific times that are, are known because it's you know time stamped on the phone. So you have this repository of all this empirical data of someone's lives that then you're able to then make uh, more informed decisions. I think that is where thinking about you know doing all that, but yet you still need the astrologer at the end of the day to be able to help interpret those things. Right. Because there's the pattern recognition of humans, but also AI can only do as much as they're trained to do in terms of machine learning and being mm -hmm. able to, you know, that same thing I talked about, the the limits of language and, and modeling versus what you do with, or kind of intuitive processes that you can't fully even understand. Yeah, and one of the things you and I were talking about that I do think is a limitation also one of the questions you run into as a counseling astrologer when looking at somebody's chart and um, making predictions is sometimes just because you can say something with astrology doesn't mean that you should. And sometimes there's a real judgment call of that the astrologer has to make in reading someone's chart or in doing a consultation of of seeing is this person capable of receiving this information and is it going to be helpful or is this actually going to be harmful or detrimental to them in some way. With the background, almost you know, like medical dictum of of do no harm, whatever the astrologer version of that is, ideally, being in the back of your mind, um, that's something where I could see I could see a machine not being as helpful or making a bad call and not having that sort of em empathetic empathy, I guess, in some way, as being something that might not be as developed um, where there could be problems. Let's say. 
Yeah. When I, when I hear you talk about that, I think about, you know, how there's a process of looking into the past and also looking to the future. Hmm. So the astrological process can be, you know, looking in the past in the story and then astrologer can tell you what something may mean, but ultimately it's still going to be up to the person as to whether or not they adopt that interpretation or whether or not they have their own interpretation for what it means in the story, in the context of the story of their life. Right. And so it's, it's still up into some ways, uh, the agency of the client to be able to under, to kind of make that judgment call as to whether or not they adopt somebody else's story about what has already happened happened. The risky thing is when you start to look into the future right. and to say, well, because of this configuration, you're never going to find love as an example, you yeah. know, because of you have this and that in detriment, then this is something that I, as an astrologer have saying that this is a potential that has now been eliminated because of, you know, that's basically bounded off into being an unlikely, unlikely probability, but I'm going to go ahead and say it's not going to happen. And that, when that was part of the premise of Minority Report, which is interesting, I was rewatching that recently and impressed by how well they did in, in predicting certain trends that are much more like feasible and plausible are actually happening now than they were 20 years ago and it came out in 2002 because they actually consulted with futurologists. But the one part that is more fantasy or sci-fi-y and not as realistic currently was the core of the story, which was the predictive capability of the three um, people that could see the future and they were using it to predict um, that a murder would take place beforehand and then they were arresting the people before they committed the murder, but still then charging them with it and everything else. But part of the premise ended up becoming that once the person knew about the future, they had a choice at that point to still go through with it or to or to make a different choice. Yeah, this is the concept of a thought crime. So having a, a computer determine that you're going to do something mm -hmm. and it, it prosecutes you for the crime before you do it. And this is, I think, to this part where I said that humans are not deterministic mathematical structures. And part of the reason why I say that is that math is incomplete. There's no way to sort of fully comp mo model someone's human behaviors in a way that is going to allow you to deterministically and concretely understand what they're going to do in the future. And I think that's where uh, cosmologically, when I look at things like relational quantum mechanics and uh, or relational realism of quantum mechanics or transactional or relational realism, these are all looking at these aspects of potentia and potential where there's a range of possibility. This is what Tarnas says of the archetypally predictive, but not concretely predictive. This is mirrored into these discussions about quantum realities where there are these potentials, these probabilities, these range of possibilities, but only one ends up once the measurement happens, it sets a context that then collapses all these things, You know, whether it's collapsed or not collapsed. There's other interpretations where uh, Wigner von Neumann says that consciousness is actually engaged in collapsing that wave function. Uh, you know, The Copenhagen interpretation says that the measurement is actually a part of helping set the context that collapses that and bounds it in some ways. But um, you know, Tim Eastman talks about for any measurement, there's an input output in the context. So there's some ways of there's a triadic relationship that is you know not something that is just deterministically determined in isolation from the world around you. And so there's this nested context that is embedded in all this stuff. So because of that nature of context and the nature of measurement and the nature of everything else, I don't think it's going to be possible to understand what the aspirations of where humans are going to be doing in the future. Like there's ways to be able to look at all the data in the world to understand and mathematically model somebody, but that doesn't mean that you're going to understand their aspirations, their intentions, their motivations, and to understand how their intentional actions are going to play out within the larger context of reality. Though that seems to be beyond the capacity of any way of understanding or modeling to a deterministic, concrete, predictive way. And I, I feel fairly confident of like saying that I'm very skeptical that that's going to be possible. I could be proven wrong, but- um, I mean, yeah. I am constantly running into a version of this with electional astrology, where part of the thing I've done over the past decade is really focused on natal as a continuing thing, but also electional and one of the things that the new technologies have afforded me with Solar fire and like the animate chart feature, which I constantly have up on like one one of my monitors, or being able to pull up the chart of the moment really easily with um, Astro Gold on my phone, is like knowing during the course of the day what the chart of the moment is at any given moment in time, and what ri the rising sign is, and what planets are rising up and hitting the ascendant, or are culminating, or hitting the descendant, or I see, and I'm constantly seeing things happen um, that either happen in my environment that perfectly match when like a planet hits an angle at that time, and the, and the, the symbolism of that planet perfectly reflects like what's happening in that moment. Like if I received like a aggressive email or something like that, and and Mars is on the de descendant at the time, or 
So there's that, but then there's also oftentimes I'm about to do something and I'm motivated to do something and would be about to in that moment, like if I'm about to send like an angry email to somebody and then I'll stop and look at the chart of the moment and like Mars will be like right on the, the ascendant at that time. And knowing what the potential outcome is sometimes if something can change it, um, but you sometimes find yourself having a choice because your own in internal impulse and if you hadn't known about that at that time would have been to go ahead and do that thing at, at that very moment. And it may have very well oftentimes in many instances, and like say, let's say that instance led to a negative outcome. And that's something you can say with not 100% certainty, but a fair amount of certainty after doing things like this over and over again enough times of knowing what electional charts uh, or inception charts are going to lead to a negative ad outcome versus a positive or constructive outcome. And there's something about that that's um, yeah, that, that creates some of the similar issues in terms of what you're talking about with the thought crime dilemma or, or similar versions of that. Yeah, and there's something about that moment when you look at the chart, the moment of astrology as Jeffrey Cornelius talks about it, is that in, in when you ask a question in horary, it's all about when the you, the the questioner the querent asks the the horary astrologer, and it's the moment that the horary astrologer decides to take on the question. Then he looks at the then he or she or they look at the chart right. at that moment, right. and it's at that moment where the answer is com, uh, contained. But it's not a moment uh, any time before or after. Well, yeah. So it's a collapsing of it's the realm of potentials that are then collapsing in that moment that are being that that sort of the realm of possibilities. All the different contextual dimensions are compressing up to that moment. To be, be able to make that judgment, so that the moment of astrology is in that moment rather than in the future. Well, we yeah, I don't. That complicates things though, because that has to do with complications with horary and what the nature of horary is, and it has to do with one of the issues. It comes down to an issue of what is the horary moment, and, Hor and Cordelius is one of the people which I actually agree with that the horary chart and part of the paradigm of horary is actually the exchange of a question between two parties, and it's based on an earlier. Framework uh, based on consultation charts that an astrologer can cast a chart for the moment a client comes to them for a consultation, and the chart will describe not just what the person is focused on, but potentially what the outcome of what their thoughts are at the time. And that was a whole genre of thought interpretation in the medieval and late Hellenistic period. So that's a, that's a whole complicated thing that has to do, though, with that branch in and of itself and what the true nature of horary is in exchanging um, a question between two parties. And that exchange not really fully taking place until the second party has accepted and read the question and decided they're going to answer it. Um, but whether that's fully, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's fully indicative of what the rest of astrology is necessarily per se, because it's tied up with in that versus a single individual paying attention to the chart of the moment. And if if it collapses at that point, if like the wave particle thing collapses at the moment that they look at it, because they still have to make a, a choice at that point and have a choice to make if they see either a positive or a negative indication and they're inclined to act at that time. Yeah, what, what brings to mind is going back to those incompleteness aspects and also pluralism. So the incompleteness meaning that for every specific system like Horary has a system set a, a specific set of axiomatic rules that it follows. And then out of that has certain uh and insights that come out of that. But given a different set of rules, you get different insights. And so that's how different branches have different sets of rules and different axioms and different ways that like and all of them work. And that's sort of the, the dilemma of pluralism, which is that there is a whole wide range of different possibilities that also seem to have contradictions between the different techniques, but yet given the astrologer and the context, that it doesn't explode into contradiction. So that's why it's sort of a a paraconsistent logic, meaning the paraconsistency is that you're able to have a little bit of inconsistencies and a little bit more of the completeness. Uh, so, like, either you know, it's not a binary choice between completeness and in, uh, and consistency. You're able to have more of a complete reaction by dealing with the little subtle aspects of inconsistency, as long as you're not sort of applying different techniques from one system from another system, where you're able to you know kind of mash things together that don't follow established rules. It's kind of a mashup that maybe doesn't doesn't work because it's kind of violating what those. It's sort of creating these inconsistencies within the system that don't yield the results because you're not following um, the logic of whatever that system is. So because of that, I do think that astrology is kind of this weird pair consistent system that does have this wide range of different rules and somehow they all work to certain degrees, but in certain contexts in ways that there's limitations for they work uh, within certain bounds. And then the, and so it's also that's the 
the challenge of, I'd say, epistemology within astrology was how do you determine what knowledge is and how do you just determine what those rules are and how do you determine what really works? That's been like an oral tradition that's been, you know, based upon the embodied experiences, but there's a transmission of, of translating those things into books. But, you know, there's limits into what those books can contain versus what the direct experiences of that. So there's always like loss in the in not only the rules but but why they work but also do they need to be reimagined or are they shifting or are they changing and can you create hypothetical planets or you know create new systems just by creating new axiomatic rules and seeing what happens based upon whatever you decide to do is it is it that flexible that you can do that with and so that's the type of things when you look at all the different techniques of astrology it seems to be indicating that the world is kind of set up like that I mean, maybe. I mean, there's a certain amount of flexibility, but I don't think it's that arbitrary necessarily. And while there's certainly like different approaches that work and have their own internal logic and consistency, and we might treat them more like languages that, you know, where you have different languages that have their own internal logic, but can work internally even if they don't interact with each other as well. Um, but then at the same time, sometimes there are, uh, did you read like the Under One Sky book where yeah. it was like, um, this guy had 10 or 12 different astrologers interpret the same chart, and some of them did a good job and got it right, but some of them didn't. And, and the, the interpretation didn't actually land with the person. And there was some there were some problems with that. I mean, one of them is that it, they were written delineations rather than actually sitting down with the client and actually replicating what a consultation would be, which would be more of a dialogue. But nonetheless, there can be um, Astrology that doesn't land or doesn't accurately depict reality, which is is not a very good or effective astrology if that's happening. So we have to make some room for that, and that's something that's kind of we've reached an, an interesting and and that's going to be one of the difficulties and great challenges I think in the next decade in this next phase of astrology is there's so many different astrologies at this point and politically astrologers that tend that for the most part the astrological tend community tends to be more liberal or left leaning and therefore more having intentions of wanting to be more inclusive and embracing diversity and therefore that question when it comes to competing astrological approaches has been framed in more of an almost quasi political context or cultural context of seeing all approaches as valid and useful and just as effective and and not negating any um but because it's also a system and a technique, and because they're also sometimes you're attempting to accomplish something, and there's some things that can be accomplished more effectively or less effectively, I think we might run into that as an as an issue um, in the coming decades in terms of that desire to want to be more inclusive, but then also that question of is are there more or less effective ways to use astrology? Yeah, I think for when I hear about those discussions, I, I often what comes up for me is I there's an anecdote within the astrology community is that given whoever you're drawn to uh, resonate with, that if you go to that astrologer with questions, that they're they're going to likely be able to provide you answers. So there's some sort of like attraction that may happen, but there's also cases where that doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, there's so have you ever had like a bad consultation? Uh, well, I have. I've only had a. Uh, most of my discussions I've actually had from my interviews and stuff. I had very mm -hmm. little like proper consultations, mm -hmm. but I, I will s I'll also give that there are certainly cases where that doesn't work. Where you know sometimes you have an alignment and sometimes you don't. Uh, I guess when I when I think about a lot of these different types of things, when you when you do like a more uh, attempting to try to do like a scientific, you know, do one chart and see what the different interpretations and have certain rules. Like there's a certain context under which that that you know could work for some and could not work for others and so the it, then for me becomes if you're not if you're going to try to reduce things down to numbers and statistics and like that it's kind of like the approach of reductive materialism or kind mm -hmm. of reducing things down into component parts but there's a a gestalt holism that is different than and how do you like so if that's true if it's different then how do you measure success or failure and is it through utility is it useful for people do they find that it's able to give them insights right. or is it able to you know reflect a part of their story of their lives because you can look at uh, astrology as a narrative technology that is a process of helping people understand their essential character and how their and their lives are unfolding in relationship to the world around them relative to the, to the world context and the world transits right so as people are going through that then uh, it's more of a phenomenological experience of whether or not it's able to provide value in their lives and from a narrative context rather than a context that could be reduced down to some sort of statistical numbers. Yeah, that was something I was thinking about recently that was interesting. Uh, 
a dichotomy or, or a split, which is that like most astrologers actually use astrology themselves as a tool for like self understanding and self knowledge in some broad sense. But most of the public is only really interested in astrology in so much as it has the ability to make accurate predictions. And there's a little bit of a difference between the two or disconnect. Yeah, I mean, there's the mundane and the natal, and again, there's different contexts in which that the people have different understandings for what you know astrology is and what it can do. Uh, I'm just constantly amazed of how robust it is and how many things it claims to do, but also uh, how many legitimate insights it's able to provide across so many different contexts. Right. Um, so one thing to bring up is you know is astrology a language because that's become almost like a cliche at this point over the past ten or twenty years. To frame astrology as a language, and I think it makes sense to think of astrology as a language in many ways. But I think it's interesting that's not that's actually in thinking about our conversations, not a way that you framed it so far. You seem to have a tendency to frame it more in the sense of mathematics or mathematical principles or something like that. But but I raise that question because if astrology is a language, then it would seem like it would be something that an AI could learn at some point up to a certain extent, in the same way that there's been. Massive leaps and bounds in, for example, you know, we we're talking about you know Google recognizing your voice and being able to process what you've said on your phone at this point, or in Google Translate being able to translate between many different languages at this point, which has just been huge progress over the past decade. Yeah, and when I when I look at Young's seven different things that he used in terms of trying to interpret uh, astrology and the the explanation for and the mechanism for how it works. One of them, which was the, this process of mathematics in the realm of which that there's a Pythagorean, a Platonic realm of ideal forms that are somehow mysteriously interfacing with reality um, from more of a formal causation perspective. And so that's how the, the blueprint and the mathematical structures are somehow interfacing with reality. So I personally am more of that mathematical Platonist uh, and Neoplatonist orientation where I do think there's a, those underlying structures and they are interfacing with reality. And I think that the uh, uh, Whitehead's eternal objects that he affords within his metaphysical system that goes from the realms of potential into the actual, there's that process of those realms of potential that have those eternal objects that you can think of as those archetypal complexes that are somehow at that lower level that have what I would call uh, Aristotelian formal causation from those blueprints and those potentials into the actuals. But at the same time, when I when I went to the math, part of the reason why I, I went to mathematics was because of the AI, but also because of uh, you, I don't think you'll find more Platonists uh, within the realm of practicing professionals or philosophers than in the realm of philosophy of mathematics, because there's a lot of practicing mathematicians who I self-identify as mathematical Platonists, which means that when they describe their day-to-day -day work, they feel like that they're actually discovering objects that are already there in another Platonic realm of ideal forms, and that they're somehow mysteriously interfacing with through their intuition or their consciousness to sort of uh, suss out what those structures of those math structures are, and that they're more kind of reporting on something that they're discovering than something that they're inventing with their language and their their mind. Hmm. Now, the opposite approach is anomalists who are thinking that everything that is being created is just a semantic description, more of the, the Wittgenstein approach of nominalism. The nominalism means naming things and giving it a name. Yeah. And that there's a whole branch of, of mathematics that's the opposite of the Platonism. You could call it either anti-Platonism or fictionalism or nominalism. All of these are saying that the math is just a language that you're setting up the rules and within the context of those rules, you have different dynamics. But that doesn't mean that there's these transcendent, non-spatial, spatial, temporal math objects that are somehow mysteriously interfacing with the structures of reality. So when I go to the American Philosophical Association, association and talk to the philosophers of math who have been steeped in the analytic tradition, they are mostly the nominalists and fictionalists. They think of math as just a language game. Mm -hmm. But when I go to the math conferences and talk to, to the actual mathematicians, they're mostly mathematical Platonists who believe that you know, there's actually these deeper structures of, of a, a kind of a tonic realm of ideal forms that they're interfacing with directly mm -hmm. that from their own embodied experience. Um, there's a book uh, by Mark Beleaguer called Platonism and Anti-Platonism Within Mathematics. And in there, he describes these two debates. And his conclusion is that both are true, that both are legitimate, but there's no way to determine which is which is true. So even though Beleaguer, the author, is like an anti-Platonist himself, he's more in the, the nominalist camp who doesn't believe that this. And the big complaint is that there's no mechanism as to how we understand how we're interfacing with these platonic realms. Like we don't, how do we know? If we're uh, products of a spatial temporal reality of metric space-time, how are, how are we interfacing with the non-spatial realm? 
uh, it's sort of an unknown mechanism as to how that interesting exchange between the sp spatial temporal and the non-spatial temporal and the non-local um, and that's sort of the process of astrology of going from those archetypal potentials and somehow collapsing it into the potential and the actual. But uh, a lot of people are also talking about the nominalist in terms of uh, mathematics. So what I part of my ar argument that I made within the Ascendant, the the second edition of from the uh, Association of Young Astrologers, I wrote an article that was saying maybe the the astrological community should look into some of these similar debates that have been happening within the, the philosophy of math mathematics because there's a lot of parallels here. So you could believe that there's actually something there going into astrology and that has some degree of uh, you know formal causation or treat it more of a language game. And what a Jungian and one of the other Jungian approaches is this a-causal uh, correlation principle of synchronicity. At like It's like a cosmic clock that's unfolding and that it's somehow correlated but not being causally related between the uh, unfolding structures of society and individuals. So that there's sort of this uh, way of these archetypal potentials that are happening internally within us, but are also being reflected into the things that we can observe with the, the motions of the planets. That there's these correlations between the 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 Kronos aspect of being able to measure those, but also the Kairos, so the quality and the archetypal potentials of those that are also matching our experience. And that the, the Tarniasen approach actually is to kind of deny the formal causation in a way and just kind of rely upon the a causal principle of the synchronicity because it sort of is in more alignment with the substance metaphysics way of thinking about things because it's if it's not causally related it's just correlated then you there's no sort of mechanistic thing that you that gets tripped up but um but in that discussion it's um the same conclusion that i have that you could you could legitimately look at um astrology as if that there, there, there are actually these platonic realms that we're interfacing with and that they're actual and they're real and that those potentials are there um castor and epperson have talked about how the, the quantum potential should be described as this ontological reality um and they've they've argued for that or i can also say and make the same argument to say that it's just a language game it's just language and that it's just describing the reality but there may be nothing there beyond us finding ways of like the wine taster trying to describe the flavors, it's just the the astrologer is describing the flavors of all the different uh, archetypal expressions, but it's us just uh, describing the language of something, but there, that doesn't mean that there's these transcendent math objects that are mysteriously interfacing with reality. So the nominalist turn and the naturalist and the ones that are the anti, the, the fictionalists and the anti-platonists in math, that the, that's kind of the treating astrology purely as a language is that kind of Wittgensteinian approach of what the Atlantic tradition of philosophy does, which is try to just reduce things down to a language game rather than something that's sort of transcendent. Yeah, and one, I don't think in order to frame astrology as a language that you have to resort to nominalism because it's actually quite the opposite. The presumption in from an astrological context is that the language would be Something that is universal and is existing out there externally from human perception, operating in the cosmos, and that is also informing our lives and providing some sort of weird narrative underlying our lives, even when we're not aware of it, which then you know implies some greater meaning of like purpose and meaning that is pre-existent um, out there in the cosmos. Um, a lot of this with the Platonism, one of the things it's bringing up that takes us back to the concept of AI, it's reminding me of is the Timaeus and how Plato um, sets up this situation where the cosmos itself is a living being or like a cosmic animal. And some of the ideas that were spun off from that in ancient Hermeticism and Stoicism that were derived from that those platonic ideas and some of the platonic tradition of the notion of the microcosm and the macrocosm and that's exactly what the theme of mundi was partially conceptualized early on was like the birth chart of the cosmos but also the birth chart of um, god in some sense so what i'm bringing that up for is it makes me think of this idea of consciousness and whether consciousness can be created in ai um and one of the questions is whether the cosmos itself has consciousness and it's a property somehow of, of the cosmos or of the universe that's inherent and sort of diffused throughout it rather than just being something that is only restricted to us and restricted to humans. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, big ideas there. The the nature of consciousness at the collective and individual scale. I want to just make a, a couple of quick comments though. The the 
the there's a paper that's called uh, machine learning as neoplatonism so there's actually people within the machine learning community that are looking at sort of philosophies of neoplatonism because this dilemma that i talked about earlier in terms of the the bottom up versus the top down having some sort of you know structures of reality that are able to kind of describe the embodied experience and kind of melding those two things together so i do think that's like a, a thing that we're we're dealing with and just to, to also kind of you know the point that you made around the nominalism and you know how you can have both you know hegel talked about the thesis antithesis but the, eventually there's a synthesis. So right now the book that's being you know presented as Platonism versus anti-Platonism, I do think that there's probably a realm where they could have a synthesis and there's a combination in a way that is able to you know blend those two realities together. I think astrology actually could be you know the end result of that, where in the, in the context of math, they it's sort of absent of a deeper embodied experience that would maybe lead people to make that leap of saying that there's some way of that they're both happening in some ways mm. that the the reality is there at a, an underlying platonic realm but there's language that's describing it and just because there's language describing it doesn't mean that it's denying that the reality of that yeah i mean mercury or astrology is a mercurial um art you know that's always one of the things about it is it always straddles the line when there is like a division or a dichotomy between two things where it all, always ends up being a little bit of both yeah and and yeah, and I, I do think that you know, as we as we look at all those things, it's uh, you know these debates that are happening in philosophy. Oftentimes, there's debates around whether there's ever progress in philosophy because you can get to a point and you say, well, both are true, and like at some point, you know, how do you decide, you know, how to you know make a choice as to what's more likely or not? So there's all these different debates, and the more that I've talked to different philosophers, I see that there's these sort of existential tensions where you can kind of go either way. So if I have a preference in any moment, I may, if someone's arguing for one side, I may argue the other side, you know, saying, well, actually, you could just describe it as a, a you know anomalist interpretation, which could be a way of people interfacing with astrology with the wide world of saying, well, there's nothing there that's there; it's just a language game. Uh, but to go back to your question around consciousness, because I think it's a really rich and deep one, because there is this question as to whether or not if we're building these a agents of artificial intelligence, do, are they conscious? And to what degree are they conscious? And to what degree are we conscious? And are, how are we conscious? And then how is the world conscious? Um, so from most of the, the beginnings of how Tarnas talks about it, he talks about this contrast between the enchanted worldview and the disenchanted worldview. The disenchanted worldview is that everything's just dead matter and that it doesn't have any consciousness to it. And right. that the consciousness is just an epiphenomena of the sort of biological organism of our body. And that the limit of materialistic per perspective is that all of our phenomenal consciousness is just merely an illusion. Um, now that I don't think is uh, sort of matches my own experience. I think that's not very satisfactory to just kind of deny my own <laughs> reality. But there is something about like your experience of phenomenal consciousness that you can't necessarily interrogate or test or get outside of that. So it, if we can't even say that we're conscious, then how are we going to say that something else is conscious? Which is sort of a you know a dilemma of like how do you measure to the degree at which your consciousness you have consciousness? And if if you can't do that for humans, then how do you expect that to do that for AI? Yeah, I mean, part of his premise also is that there was a, in the modern viewpoint, there's like consciousness and there's everything outside of that which is disconnected, and there's a stark division between you and the cosmos. But then in ancient cosmologies, he was saying there was um, not a disconnect. There was your consciousness, but also there was consciousness occurring in the cosmos. And that astrology, the biggest thing that it points to is that. Um, there is actually a connection and a mirroring between your consciousness and the movements of the planets, which implies that there's a more of an embodied um, consciousness or soul that's existing in the cosmos as well, like outside of you as well as inside of you. Yeah, I know that Tarnas often quotes Plotinus saying that everything breathes together as a part of Plotinus's explanations of astrology in terms of this this coordination that's this larger organism that is somehow related to each other and i think that enchanted worldview of you know what what hillman would call the anima mundi or the world soul i do believe that there is some aspect of that uh, and I, the way that i understand it is those realms of potential that are sort of like the universe is being constructed moment to moment that we sort of we because of our you know pr uh, substance metaphysics we sort of think of our embodied experience of like this table is here and that it's physical and reality and there's a way that we project that uh, model of reality onto like the entire universe is something that's kind of like the static object that's not dynamic and any of the properties of qualia uh, are qualities that are properties on top of that but what this shift towards the process relational approach is putting sort of the qualitative aspects at more of a core reality 
some more of this debate as to whether or not there's universals and how those universals and those qualities, if they're kind of embedded at a deeper part of reality in those platonic forms, and that as we see them manifest in reality, if we're kind of being recalled back to those deeper forms of reality and that we're experiencing our, our, our emotions and our qualities, based upon that both the the final causation which means the intention of the maker who's creating it but also the formal causation which means the the math structures that are underlying it that are shaping different aspects of those qualities so both the final causation and formal causation are key parts i think of kind of understanding the degree to which that you know with whitehead it's like the whole and also the quantum loop gravity is like there's the quantum substrate and that from there the metrical space time is coming out of that and the way that Whitehead describes it is that there's these, rather than physics being like these um, sort of matter, and then physics on top of, uh, you know, uh, biology and chemistry, and then on up into like psychology and sociology, but the grounding of modern science is physics. However, what Whitehead is saying is that like the grounding of reality should be biology and these organisms, because you have to think in terms of these ecosystems of relationships and patterns of energy that are in relationship to each other. And when you look at things in terms of those metaphors of or ecological ecosystems, then you can describe the lowest aspects of reality from the quantum potential and all these archetypal potentials that are having those non-Boolean logics and those potentials archetypally. And then somehow moment to moment, everything is kind of collapsing into the construction of the universe, but that there's these structures that are kind of nested to each other, just like the natal chart is the underlying aspect that sets the context of your life, that there's these deeper structures that are longer processes that are unfolding. And then within the context of those, then there's smaller and smaller nested contexts that are within that context. And so like all of reality are these, you know, processes all the way down. It's processes that are unfolding at different scales. And so you can look at different outer planetary cycles and you can look at the, you know, Neptune Pluto of a 494 year year cycle, well, that's like a, the deeper cycle that is setting the, the larger contextual dimensions of that epoch. And then you have the, you know, you know, Uranus Neptune is, which is another scale where there's like, you know, two of those forever, those three, and then there's the, um, uh, Uranus and Pluto. And so on and on and on, there's different scales of different planetary periods that within those they're creating this, what, um, you know, and, and philosophy is called this muriology, which is sets of nested contexts that are kind of fractally nested within each other. And so if you think about the math structure of process, it's those fractally nested processes that are that are kind of all connected together. So given that, it's sort of, you know, the concepts of the anima mundi means that there's like a trajectory and a movement of, you know, these dynamics that are unfolding and that has a telos, it has a, a purpose or it has a movement. And then from there, it somehow gets constructed in reality based upon how we react and interact and, you know, at the collective scale, but also as individuals. Yeah, um, nested... The idea of nesting, <laughs> that takes me back to the artificial intelligence thing. And if astrology could be used as a model for art artificial intelligence or for creating consciousness, thinking about how that would work and thinking about like a birth chart and thinking about the different planets and what each of the planets represents and the different drives or in psychological astrology, the different psychological impulses that each of the planets is said to be associated with, like Mercury as communication, Moon as your emotions or your body, um, you know, Jupiter as uh, the sort of growth and expansion side of things, Saturn as the contraction side, and different things like that. I mean, we could probably take some of those and use those as a model of the things that are necessary impulses to have as a like sort of like the the spheres of the planets in ancient astrology of these different concentric spheres that are necessary. And only once you put all those pieces together, do you have like a full model for what consciousness is? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I know that Chad Harris has actually gone to different uh, consciousness conferences presenting archetypal cosmology as a model of consciousness. And mm -hmm. so it is uh, something that has started to maybe get into more of the more esoteric uh, approaches of these modern discussions around consciousness. But I totally agree with everything you said in terms of like, there is something very powerful about the astrological process that models dimensions of, pro of our consciousness that kind of have this it's a it's a system that's very holistic and interconnected in a way that you don't see very many other math structures or systems that can really do that at that same scale. And to see how there are these nested contexts that 
or these nested, um, you know, cycles that have different scales that are unfolding in different ways and they're combining. And then not only is that happening as an individual, but that's also happening at a collective society. So there's this interesting, and that's the nested part of like the individuals, a part of that larger context of a whole, but also is contributing sometimes if they have like, you know, a universe opposition, they make a big breakthrough like Jung or Freud or, or Newton or Galileo, any of these folks that are like coming through with big breakthroughs that comes from the individual that then seeps into the collective at maybe those, you know, these, these moments of opportunity that are able to make that. And so there's this interchange between the culture and the individuals that are happening. Uh, but you know, with AI right now, the, as I talked to different AI researchers, what they, they say is that basically anything that a human could put a label on, you can start to train a supervised learning machine learning process to do that. The challenge is that you could start to maybe, you know, the quote we talked about Kierkegaard yesterday, which is that, you know, life can only be understood backwards, but it has to be lived forwards. I think the same thing happens here because you could look at everything that's happened up to a certain point of someone's life and maybe come up into a math structure that describes everything and maybe help to model and have them gain some intuition and insight into their lives. But are you able able to ever, you know, get into those aspirations or those intentions or those parts about their lives that, you know, they make a choice that how do you how do you know what choice they're going to make mm -hmm. uh, that could set their lives off to a completely different part? So that that challenge of trying to project and predict into the future is a much harder problem. Right. But if you have that math structure of the astrology and you're doing say some really evil psychographic profiling where you're trying to understand someone's intentions or behaviors uh, and trying to model the personality and behavior, then yeah, something like astrology could be really dangerous if, if into the hands of someone who's got access to all this biometric and physiological and biometric data of all of your behaviors and across different actions, you know, i.e. meta or these big surveillance capitalism companies, there could be ways in which that, you know, otherwise it'd be just a lot of lots of undifferentiated data but given the context and the story of what the astrology would say, they may be able to make this close the gap between what those actual potentials are and what the actuals are. And then maybe, maybe at that point, I think it's still an open question as to even if they are able to do that and create the perfect model of all your behaviors up to this point, can they still be able to tell you what they're going to, what you want in the future, what your aspirations are, or what your preferences are, or if they're able to really tune into the deeper aspects of consciousness and, and context that is missing from some of those models? Yeah, well, and let's get into that because that'd be an interesting discussion. Um, direction of the dystopic scenarios for this and how astrology could be used. But I'll, before we get there, just briefly to mention the other thing that's unique is each chart and each birth chart, in addition to being unique and being a completely unique snapshot of that moment in time that's never fully recreated, the cosmos is never fully recreated with all those placements at that unique moment in time. You also have all of the birth charts that you're interacting with through synastry in your family unit, like growing up or in the people that are in your immediate environment. And those charts are interacting and influencing the development of certain placements in your chart in some ways that are more constructive and other ways that might be more challenging or destructive or inhibitive, like encouraging certain parts of the chart to grow or inhibiting it through the charts of people you're interacting with um, at different points in your life or you know, eventually friends or eventually partners or people you work with or what have you. Um, additionally, each person that has a unique chart is also moving through time and experiencing transits at different points in their life or activations through timing at different points. So there's a lot of really unique things that would also have to be taken into account that just starts getting crazy complex and complicated if you're talking about trying to program that or use that as a model for AI and some of the issues that you would run into. Um, but yeah, so so let's get into some of the dystopian scenarios. Though Facebook's already using things like, um, you know, you you mentioned and you talked about using ads in order to, um, you know, knowing a person's preferences or knowing what websites they're viewing, and then they're using that in order to know what ads to serve you that you might click on. So that's like a very really base. It's really early days of some of that stuff. Um, they're also taken into account. You know, we've run into issues of people using political targeting, like targeting certain demographics or certain people that have certain types of views that they want to target or influence in order to influence the how they'll vote or something like that by serving them propaganda or, or different things like that. So the astrological component of that, at some point, if any company like of that stature wanted to take that stuff seriously, could be gearing certain things towards them in either in terms of ads or in terms of political propaganda that might 
resonate with them more highly and using that in some way to um, influence them. Let's say just influence their behavior in some way, even subtly. Yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a lot of existing what is referred to as psychographic profiling. So tracking your behaviors and then trying to create some model of who you are that either is, you know, I don't think they're trying to get as far as to describe your essential character from like the, at the low level of your, 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 you know, who you are as a person that would be astrologically, that would have a, a quite a astrological um, connection. Um, it's mostly around like, are you interested in this type of activity or would, you know, because when they're trying to come up to uh, have people and advertisers do a search and say, we want to find everybody in Denver, Colorado, that's into astrology. You know, that that's sort of sometimes at the level uh, that they're going. They're not like getting so specific as to somebody who's like, and also a, a Leo rising and, you know, has who has a, a tight configuration of uh, Neptune and the moon, you know, something like that. Like, they're, not, they're not getting to that degree of specificity of the different types of profiling because utility wise, that doesn't serve them anything. Like you can't, like no one's searching for, you know, moon Neptune conjunctions in, in Colorado. So that's like, even, even if that were, that doesn't have enough of that context. And so in some hands that's, that's good news because like, if they did have all those tools that could be like down a path, that's like even darker than we are now, which we may be leading there in terms of, as we continue to progress. Um, one of the trends I just wanted to call out is this concept of contextually aware AI. So AI that, and this is, you know, especially in the context of uh, augmented reality, so you're walking around with, uh, you know, what they call ego-centered data capture with these cameras that are measuring each and everything that you're seeing. And so there's this process right now that Meta is going through, which is trying to take all that computer vision and, and basically the data stream that would be coming from your eyes, but trying to capture all of that and to create models of your context and that understand the relational dimensions of your context and to be able to, let's say, you're in your kitchen. And when you're in your kitchen, you want to say... You know, uh, you know, a good example of context and pragmatics is like, say, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, like when you are uh, talking to somebody who is a computer programmer and say, you know, we need to update that script. Well, you're talking probably about a computer program. But if you're talking to someone who's a screenwriter and say, we need to update this script, then they're talking about, you know, a, se a series of characters in the context of a movie. So depending on whether or not you're talking to a, in the movie context to a screenwriter or a programming context to a computer person, saying we need to update the script means different things. So the challenge of AI is as you're going about these different contexts, knowing how to take natural language input, but also understanding your world around you. And so, um, yeah, that's a difficult thing. And I don't know if they'll ever be able to kind of programmatically determine your context. Astrologically, there's a whole system of context through the, uh, the astrological houses. And it's very specific as to what those houses, but you know, we could be sitting here in a quote unquote a professional context in this movie studio, but we could start to talk about our relationships. So we move into a seventh house context. So there's a fluidity in which that you may be grounded in an environmental context, but that doesn't always mean what the uh, content of that context is. Mm -hmm. um, you can create, you know, kind of a nested area where you can make a guess if you're at work, you're going to be talking about work. But, um, you know, that's that's the degrees which there's a, kind of an incompleteness for how AI is going to be able to determine what that context is. Um, and even as you were talking about all those different aspects of, you know, the people that were around you, you're starting to talk about the contextual domains of all the things that were shaping you as you were growing up, that other people with their charts and their transit and their, their progressions, all their timing techniques are kind of feeding into you into this, you know, sets of nested contexts of your family and everything else is, you know, probably above and beyond your natal chart. Your natal chart is born within that context of a, a lineage of all of these other people. But all those other people are also in the context of the culture that's unfolding. Right. So it's sort of like, like the, the nested context goes way down. Yeah, natural, like the national horoscope for like the United States or something, for example. Um, well, it's just one of those things I've always thought about in terms of the question of twins, of two people born at the same time that have the same birth chart and why can their lives turn out so differently? And part of the answer is like they grow up in different contexts, like their family units and, and things like that. Um, yeah. So. Uh, before we wrap up, because we're at about two hours here, and I got to take you to the airport in about an hour. Um, I wanted to talk about timing. Do you remember why Ray Kurzweil was talking about the 2040s as being his like projected date for con for AI achieving consciousness or for singularity? I haven't read a lot of Kurzweil. I did go to a singularity conference where he spoke back in like 2007. Mm -hmm. um, you seemed like you're not a fan. No, he's very reductive materialistic and, you know, kind of like, I don't know, like he's, there's a ways, ways in which that, that he kind of puts AI as this kind of super intelligence God that we're going to be reaching for. And I think that kind of creates a, 
it sort of ignores the different, you know, dialectic materialism dimensions of Marcus of, of, of like who owns these different super intelligence beings and how are they actually serving us as, as people. And, you know, kind of like, I don't know, it, it gets into this point where you almost are not in right relationship to the technology in the world around you. So there's these concepts of the singularity that are just feel like this kind of spinning out of control, like almost this thing we're striving towards that would be a great thing to achieve. When actually, to me, it sounds like a hell place to kind of like have technology that's so out of control or so unpredictable. Um, but that's that's sort of my impression based upon listening to him talk. And I haven't read his work closely to be able to you know specifically detail things. But what I will say, I is, mean, that is one of the debates, though. Even aside from him, is whether we should be trying to develop AI or not, or whether that's something that could get out of control um, if we did develop a, a conscious entity that has its own. Impulses and and makes starts making its own decisions about what it feels like it's is in its best interests and like some of the billionaires have been like we shouldn't be doing this or or we should put more laws in place or even try to regulate this more because of the potential dangers or downfalls. Yeah, well, there's there's a couple of things there. One, and I and I think about this because when I try to think of the context of like you know my question yesterday, which is I've always wanted to get together a group of astrologers that are interested in this and then say. If this is possible, and if this is developed, let's just say hypothetically, sometime in the next century, what major mundane astrological alignments look like? They could be a turning point when this could happen, or some version of this could happen. But in order to answer that question, we first have to define the scope of like what are some of the different possibilities, and and so that's why it's important to talk about this question of would it be like could it be a benevolent thing, or could it be a malevolent like a negative thing for humanity? Because then. That's going to give you the context of what you're looking for and what what might catch your eye in terms of future transits in the 2040s or 50s or 60s or what have you. Yeah, yeah. So to kind of address this, I think just to take a step back and to answer the basis under which the dates that Chris Wells making is that he's kind of looking at these aspects of Moore's law, which is like this doubling of computing technologies. And so as you continue to increase the capacity of computing technologies, it starts to kind of match what's possible within like the human brain and then even go beyond the human brain. So, okay. So, so the like, exponential growth of processors is is largely what he's focused on. Yeah, there's like a processing of Moore's law. There's a doubling of uh, every so often. I don't know exactly what the time period is, but a pretty consistent way in which that Moore's law has held for a really long time, which is like given a certain amount of time, the the processing power will double. Right. Um, and that doubling has been exponential for a long, long, long time. And it's right. like, what's the limits of Moore's law? Is it going to end? Are they going to come up with completely new architectures that continue this exponential dub doubling that's been happening? Yeah, because we keep thinking it'll hit a wall, but then it doesn't, and they overcome that technical hurdle, and then it just keeps growing exponentially at the same rate, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like this weird Moore's law that he's based a lot of his base his his analysis is based on the kind of the basis of Moore's law and its assumption of continuing, and then given that increased amount of processing power than what's possible with AI. Okay. So you're kind of on this scale of, you know, at, at some point uh, exceeding what humans can do and, and what we can even understand, which then brings the question of ethics of AI and also, you know, explainable AI and safety in AI. And the whole reason why the entity of open AI was created was to start to have like more of an open source uh, development of these AIs rather than having AI developed within the context of these private corporations that, you know, they go off and build super intelligence that basically destroys humanity is kind of like the fear. Um, the good news in, about AI in general, I guess, in, in some ways is that there has been a pivot and a move towards uh, open publishing, even from the major publishers, even Apple, who's notoriously secretive about nearly everything. But these uh, Meta and Google and Amazon, uh, all these big major technology companies have been publishing their insights about AI and how to do the best algorithms for different neural network architectures and whatnot. So there's been an exponential increase about the advancements of AI in part because of this open sharing of knowledge at these different conferences over the last year. Mm -hmm. Part of that is because in order to really benefit from the AI, you still need to have the data. So in the absence of not having the data, then it, they feel comfortable in being able to kind of talk about the algorithms that are driving it. That has increased the amount of innovation, but still at the same time, the application of the AI means that they still have to have access to those data. So as we move into this realm of like, are we going to start to get to this point where we start to develop these super intelligence beings? Uh, Nick Bolstrom talks about this in his book in terms of philosophically how to address this. Uh, OpenAI is trying to do that from more of a, you know kind of a nonprofit approach of seeing like what are the best practices for how to develop AI in a way that's ethical and responsible. But I think in terms of the the um, kind of oversight and the laws, there's this um, you know I think of the mere logical nested context when it comes to. Uh, there's the culture, then there's the laws, then the market dynamics of the economy, and then there's the underlying technological architecture and the code. 
So all the code is being built within the context of the economy, built in context of the, the larger laws, built in context of the culture and what those cultural values are that are driving it. And I think the, the challenge that I have with the singularity concepts is those underlying, those values of what's driving and why. It's sort of like the technological innovation for tech, technology's sake, but with, without really taking consideration the more economic dynamics and whether that's going to be good for society in a way. Right. It makes me think of how when the nuclear atomic bomb was first developed, how there was like a debate where they didn't know if they like set this thing off, off if it was going to like set the atmosphere on fire. And there's like a non-zero chunk of scientists that were like, probably shouldn't do this because we don't know what the outcome is going to be and it could destroy the world. And then it, it didn't. And it turned out when they started testing it, the worst case scenarios weren't there in terms of it, of it nuking the atmosphere, but this sense of like unknowing before you cross that threshold of you know we don't know like the we know some of the different possibilities and some of them are pretty dire but then there's also like the positive ones or the ones in between um, it also makes me think of astrologically something that's going to be relevant is you know we keep getting reports about Mike Brown um, who discovered Sedna or Eris one of the two the astronomer and he's like in search of a new planet that he thinks is out there because. Um, like with, I think Neptune. There's some of the the orbits of the planets they say are being um, thrown off a little bit or being perturbed by some sort of gravitational influence, which he thinks is another pretty large planetary body out there. And um, what it would mean, you know, what if one of the things that happens, let's say, in the next few decades, is there's like a discovery of a new planet, and that coincides with the development of some sort of conscious AI or something like that. That would be a really interesting scenario astrologically, in the same way that some major turning points in history over the past 300 years coincided with the discovery of new outer planets that represented something that was new that didn't fully exist up to that point, or maybe parts of the concept existed and were operative in society, but that the discovery of that new planet also um, unleashed something new in sort of the history of humanity or human consciousness. Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. And when I hear conscious AI, I immediately have like a visceral reaction of just like, that's not going to happen, Chris. It's never going to happen. I'm not, well, uh, like, <laughs> well I'm but it to, might, but it I, might. But I, mean, I think, I mean, think about like your discovery of Uranus and like electricity coming out of nowhere over the past few, past century and just how that's revolutionized society in such a quick way or, you know, discovery of Neptune and moving motion pictures or, um, you know, Pluto, discovery of Pluto and, and the development of the atomic bomb and the ability for humanity suddenly to wipe itself out for the first time in history. We've never had that, that possibility and that seeming maybe so far fetched and not being possible, you know, a few hundred years ago, but suddenly having possibilities that previously were never even on the drawing board or on the table before. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. It could, it just seems like it could go either way. Well, I, I would have uh, uh, two comments. Uh, one, the language around conscious AI versus what I prefer is artificial general intelligence, which I think is a little bit neutral in terms of like saying conscious AI is kind of presuming a metaphysical concept about what consciousness is and that, that, that machines will be able to have it, which I think may not be able to ever really be proven one way or the other. I mean, well, we don't know. And I, that's the thing is I'm neutral on it, whereas you sound like you're more, you're like, that's definitely not possible. Well, we can't tell if humans have consciousness. I think within the bounds of, let's say, this discussion that what we consider to be consciousness and what humans possess in terms of that, um, you know, that's just a general generic definition of what we mean by consciousness. And so the question is just, is that something that only humans can have or is that something that, well, there's also a question of do animals have that same level of consciousness that, hum that humans have and the debates that humans have about that, the degree of consciousness that animals have. Um, and then also, can that extend to, or can that be replicated in some way in artificially? Yeah, what I, what I would say is that, well, first, just in response of the, like, I know I have a phenomenal consciousness, but I don't know if you do, because I may be living in a solipsistic world where everything sort of is a, is a dream being constructed in a way that I have no idea what your experience is and if it's matched to mine. And so just the same, if I look at a robot or a machine, I, I'm still not going to be able to make that same type of determination because we don't know what a consciousness is. We have no way of measuring it or understanding it, or it's like a big philosophical and scientific problem. So um, that's why my resistance. But the other point is, I guess, if we're talking about like 
will be another way of measuring or giving some sort of indication as to whether or not these uh, artificial intelligent virtual beings, artificial general intelligence, whatever you want to call them, conscious AI, um, if they're able to take actions that are working in, in sort of harmony with the deeper archetypal potentials that are emerging. So let's say that uh, there's the big uh, uh, Uranus opposite Pluto opposition that's coming up. And let's say we have some sort of either artificial general intelligence or, or conscious AI. What happens when you have a bunch of those and they act together? Are they start to be able to produce things that have the same type of cultural artifacts that have embedded within it the deeper archetypal potentials of those different transits? Would that be a measure as, as to whether or not these AI entities are kind of working in harmony with the deeper unfolding of the archetypal potentials of reality, just as humans do with human culture, as Tarnas has explicated in the Cosmos and Psyche, can AI be able to achieve that same level of in being in dialogue with the anima mundi to the point where you're able to see proof of that through the archetypal expression of whatever they're creating, mm. which I think is an interesting way of kind of measuring whether or not things are kind of in harmony with the deeper structures of reality. And I think that we'll probably need something like quantum computing because I feel like quantum computing is something that has built in it maybe these realms of non-Boolean logic that go into the realms of potential that are analogous to the non-Boolean realms of archetypal potentials that then get somehow collapsed into actualities. So is it the the quantum computing on top of the artificial intelligence that will lead into these sort of artificial general intelligent beings that are kind of like, or able to kind of tune and train just like we elect and create something with an archetypal character, we take a quality of the moment and we build something that then over time evolves that has like the chart, like it has transits like a person does. Right. And we're able to track the behavior based upon uh, an analysis of the natal chart. I, I give like possibility that something like that could exist. I just don't know if it'll be conscious or not. Well, because we already do that to some extent where you know, there's there was natal astrology and then later also there was inceptional astrology um, which is that you can cast the chart for the birth of just about anything, um, anything that has a moment of origin, and the chart for that will describe something about the quality of that thing as well as its future. And so that can be like the chart of two people getting married. It can be the founding of like a company, like the incorporation of a company, um, the building of a house, the start of a company of a country. Um, there's all sorts of any things because astrology is fundamentally dealing with something about time and something about time having like qualitative properties, but also that the moment of origin of anything has some sort of seed potential for its ultimate outcome or its ultimate um, end or telos or what have you. And I think in that context, or when astrology gets not reduced down to that, but seen in that very fundamental way of dealing with those properties of time. That that yeah, you could have a chart, a birth chart for you know an an AI or certain um, AIs having a moment of origin, maybe that could be read in some way with astrology. Yeah, and I, and I wonder to what degree some of those that are things are created that are humans that are doing that and coming together and making that versus creating something that. Is able to make its own choices in some fashion. Um, you know, I think about like the I Ching we were talking a little bit about um, the other day, where there's the casting of the I Ching that has a probabilistic chance, probably whether it's a drawing star uh, straws or you know flipping coins. There's a probability that's associated that, and that when you come to the I Ching with either whatever the quality of the your intention is or the question or just the moment that you're checking in, you're bringing that presence to sort of see to what of the archetypal potentials are being uh, you know described in the hexagrams for the I Ching, but then you're moving into another one. So you're going from one I Ching to the next. So there's a movement for the dynamic flux from one to the next. So given that, like, are there existing things that are you either probabilistically making choices over time that you can start to see that are just kind of randomly making behaviors? Are there ways that things that we've already existing that you could look at a natal chart analysis and to see those choices and behaviors over time? Are they following some transit behaviors that we would expect based upon it? And if the mechanism of that probability is something that is programmed, or if there's something like a quantum electrodynamic, you know, probable, there's ways of doing random number generators from a quantum process that is able to, you know, I know the, the Global Consciousness Research Project is an example where they're able to see these spikes of um, collective attention based upon. Uh, these random number generators that are based upon a quantum process that are 
you know, saying that, you know, when there's people paying attention to one thing around the world, then you see these spikes in this, you know, global consciousness project. So just the same, if you have like a quantum basis to some sort of AI entity that is out in the world and it's able to make what we presume is some degree of intentional actions, it's making choices. So to be able to see the choices that those entities make, and then to see if the the natal transits of those or the, the timing techniques or all the variety of different astrological ways of looking at how time unfolds, are you able to describe those actions over time in a way that goes above and beyond what you would expect through, you know, contrasting it to like something that's more of a static object that's out into the world or something that doesn't have its own ability to make its own choices? Yeah. When you were mentioning the I Ching, that made me think of something my partner, Lisa, talks about a lot and that different people that do different types of divination talk about a lot about some of these different divinatory systems having different characters and giving you different types of answers and sometimes almost having like a personality that um, can be funny in different ways, like like talking about the I Ching, sort of um, like messing with you sometimes, or like giving you an answer that's kind of like cheeky or something like that, versus different tarot decks having different qualities, and that may have to do with the quality of the moment in which that divinatory system was created, yeah. and having a certain type of birth chart, and by extension, then and extending the concept of inceptional or cathartic astrology into. AI, you know, there's going to be different AIs that are born in different moments that take on the quality of that moment. And that actually, in the same way that, you know, you always talk, you've mentioned several times Tarnas's whole thing about how the best predictive thing they could find that would tell how people would experience different psychotropic um, experiences of, you know, taking an acid trip and whether they had a good experience or a bad experience was the astrology and the transits of that moment. Um, probably different types of AI that are created in the future, um, their level of probably to some extent like benevolence or, or malevolence is partially going to be based on them taking on the quality of that moment and the birth chart that they have in the moment describing some of the, their potential and some of the, the character or the quality of it. Yeah, for sure. And it, it just makes me also think of like this process of creating objects of uh, astrological magic kind of electing a very specific time. So right. what's it mean to elect uh, an AI that then continues to evolve and then imagining a future where we're having these different interactions where we're maybe getting some uh, astrological remediation from an AI that was born at a certain time that, you know, could be centuries, years old that have seen, you know, like a long time of taking in all this information. So right. like as we project out seven generations from now, what's it mean to, to interact with these AI that are these ancient elders that have all this information of the of all, tracking all the contextual dimensions that are able to really identify the the unpattern the unfolding patterning of of both culture and individuals and are you going to be engaging with these AI to be able to have like a a depth psychological remediation for a transit that you're going through or something that you're you're you need to have a, a complex of those things all working to you in a in a virtual reality experience that that is trying to you know to some end of of allow you to walk out of that experience and know some knowing so much more about where you're at in your own life because you're able to to get this grand amount of insight based upon these interactions, either from a symbolic kind of dream logic state where you kind of get into an altered state of uh, 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 the story world that allows you to kind of let go of any specifics, but have an archetypal experience that's reflective of your life, or to have something that's very specifically directed towards you as an individual based upon it getting uploaded to this whole, you know, all this information that you've collected about yourself over time that you're able to you know, give permissions to share to entities that you want to give additional insights into your life. Yeah. Well, and also, what is the attitude of the ATI AI? Like, what is the attitude? And like, do you have an AI that was created with like um, Cancer rising and Jupiter in a day chart right on the ascendant? And it's kind of like a benevolent, uh, charitable AI or charitable, let's say, consciousness or general AI. Or alternatively, does it have like um, you know Mars on the degree of the ascendant with Saturn and Pluto there in a day chart. And so it's like an, an aggressive um, sort of thing that's sort of cutting or divisive in some way, or has some sort of basic um, potential of, of, of taking away or of destruction or something like that. Yeah, what, what makes me think of is it's not only the when it was elected, but it's also who elected it in the deeper con context of who made it and why they made it and and all those deeper layers of context that we've been talking about that it's not just the time but it's also who is shaping it because yeah, you know like a military ai for example exactly yeah um which i guess you know in terminator is what skynet was originally which would maybe part of the problem of then context 
and I and invoke some of the movies just because I think some those are like our modern day myths. And even though it's like fiction, sometimes it's a useful like guide point for understanding deeper archetypal principles and dynamics that are worth talking about as potential. Just in the same way that in the fifties, you know, there were sci-fi stories about things that may or may not happen in the future that then sort of now are, are modern realities. I would say yes and no. Uh, when I talk to AR researchers, they would disagree mm. because a lot of modern depictions of AR are very dystopic. And that's more of a product of our entertainment industry that is driven towards kind of like apocalyptic dystopias. Yeah. So I don't think, and if you look at a different cultural context of Japan, it has a completely different, more you know, protopic you know, ways in which that it's serving us rather than something that we should be afraid of. Right. So you, I think a lot of those movie depictions actually have generated a lot of hyperbolic fear that goes above and beyond what is even, what AI is even capable of. Yeah, I was just saying in terms of the range of different possible manifestations, and I wasn't necessarily just thinking of negative ones, but also some positive ones like, um, for example, the Oracle and the Matrix, which was more of a, um, like I said, an intuitive AI, but also one that right. actually, unlike the other dystopic like architect one that just wanted to keep humanity enslaved, actually had some empathy for humanity and desire to see it survive and to end the conflict and reconcile uh, the machines with humans rather than keep them enslaved, for example. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, this has actually been one of the most fun and like interesting conversations that I've ever recorded. And <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to record this as a, or release this as an episode of the Casual Astrology Podcast for sure, but I'm going to be seriously tempted to release it as an episode of the Astrology Podcast at some point in the long term. Yeah, that's fine. As well. I'd like to um, record the time as a result of that because I didn't at the very beginning. So we've been talking, it says, for two hours and 23 minutes, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, what is it, 317 or something? So I know that I opened Solar Fire here on December 19th, 2021 at 1250 PM in Denver, Colorado with 19 Aries rising. And that's when I started getting the computer set up. But where did, what is, so it's two hours and 24 minutes recording. So right now it's what, 318. Three, so what's, what's 318 minus two hours and 24 minutes? It's right before, it's like, um, so the 20, it's like five, it's like 1055 or something like that. 1055? Or no, um, so 1255. 1255. Okay, let me or animate wait. the chart and take it back. Let's see. Is that right? So two hours, or maybe one fifty-five. I don't know. I'm, I'm. You're putting me on the spot okay. to do math. Yeah, yeah I'm not good like... either. That's why I was putting you on the spot. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna take animate the charts. Three eighteen right now. I'm gonna subtract. You said two, two hours. hours and, and, yeah, and so then twelve fifty-five. I think yeah. Twenty-four minutes. Yeah, I think that's right. Twelve fifty-five or somewhere around that. Okay, and that brings us back to approximately twelve. 55 ish for starting this conversation was about 21 Aries rising. The ruler of the ascendant was Mars in Sagittarius in the ninth house, uh, conjunct the south node, and Mercury was culminating just past culmination on the midheaven at 11 Capricorn with Mercury at 9 Capricorn. The moon was in Cancer, applying to an opposition with Mercury, and uh, yeah, good times. So yeah, that was yeah. a chart of our, our inception of this conversation in, in some ways and depicting some of this conversation and, and who knows, and maybe in some ways the, the influence in the long term in the future. Yeah, I'd say I, I'm very driven philosophically of all this stuff. So all the stuff that I have covered, there's like a philosophical uh, through line through a lot of these topics that go back to these questions around Platonism and you know, if it's just the you know, consciousness, each of these things. And uh, what I find interesting is that when I have a, an opinion in each of those, it gives me a portal into each of these different domains. And so mm. it was fun to really, you know, talk to you, someone who's deeply studied a lot of the different, you know, philosophical traditions of, of uh, you know, astrological tradition, but then to, because I actually do think that there's a lot of these different um, ideas that are being expressed, say, through something like category theory as an example, which is like a, an algebra of relationships that is starting to maybe have this a translation of an archetypal representation of math that's very similar to um, you know archetypal astrology in a way that is trying to come up with these primary categories. Well, category theory is from the math side trying to do that. So as we move forward, there's going to be aspects of category theory that are, are applied into different things like AI and virtual reality and you know the basis, the, the underlying basis that category theory may be the underlying foundations of math in a way that 
math foundations are kind of in a in a place where there's no singular thing. Maybe pluralism is going to be the foundation that you kind of add all these things together, which may be you know also true. But those insights of the kind of archetypal insights that maybe uh, like when I talk to philosophers of math around category theory of why it works, they're kind of they're perplexed as to why it would work or how. And so there may be an archetypal cosmology perspective that gives insights into things like category theory or in insights into things like the future of AI and, and storytelling. I think storytelling is probably the thing where AI and astrology are going to interface the most. But then all these more speculative things that we've been talking about are also uh, getting into these deeper assumptions you have about the nature of consciousness, about the nature of computing, the nature of the limits of, of what you can do and what you can't do, what humans can do, what technology can't do. And so as we move forward, I think we'll get some answers, uh, maybe by 2042, 2043. Yeah. We'll like, we'll have like, it'll be very clear as to, uh, what, what some of those, you know, answers will be maybe, you know, sometime between 2034 to 2051, some of these different theoretical questions will, we're asking here will be answered based upon the empirical, uh, creation of some technologies that very clearly made an assumption and were able to provide something that was above and beyond what would have been created in the absence of some some deeper metaphysical assumption. Yeah, I meant to show earlier this slide from, that you had yesterday, which just shows that pile up of like outer planet cycles in the late 2030s and early 2040s of a bunch of overlapping outer planet alignments that seems pretty like a pretty significant turning point in terms of human history. And that was the only reason not knowing a lot otherwise about some of those predictions about singularity, but just being interested that some of them are talking about the early 2040s for Whatever other reasons, and and seeing that there, um, yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting. But yeah, Ready Player One was actually set in like really like twenty forty five or something like that, I think. And okay. Wade Watts was born in like you know the sort of Uranus. Uh, the, the timing of the the character in these fiction places ends up a nice correlation. But yeah, some of it's, those different. It's funny sometimes what those things get and what they what they get right and what they get wrong. Like I, I always was disappointed, you know, um, Back to the Future Part Two. With the um, uh, hoverboards, the hoverboard skateboards was set in like 2017 or something like that. And once we get to the got to 2017, I was pretty disappointed that there was no hoverboards still. But we did get like uh, the electronic like e motor scooters and the other little um, you know sort of wheels that you can ride around the city on. So that's I guess that's a approximation. Well, and you can have your flying cars within VR now. So yeah. you know, you don't have to wait until them actually being in reality. You can have the virtual experience of it and it could be just as good, maybe. Yeah. Well, and that actually is interesting. Not I don't think I don't know if we're gonna get there, but Uranus and Gemini, that's what I forgot to mention yesterday, in the second half of this decade and like autonomous driving vehicles and how much that's going to change society and just the direction that that's going. I'm really curious about that with Uranus and Gemini in terms of changes in how we get around locally. Yeah. Yeah. Power, there could be a big breakthrough thing for how we have, you know, sort of free energy type of ideas, or, you know, there could be, you know, quantum computing with AI, with, you know, other aspects of virtual reality and artificial and you know intelligence with, you know, uh, virtual reality. So all these, you know, cryptocurrencies also, you know, which we talked about yesterday. So mm -hmm. you have the confluence of all these exponential technologies that are coming together. Then, as long as you know, my caveat: as long as they're in right relationship with the Earth and the world around us, then it could be you know that these technologies are either empowering us or enslaving us in different ways, right. uh, both from the companies, but also the way that we're kind of either destroying our ecological civilization or we're becoming into more harmony with the world around us. So, yeah, there's not any one uh, you know technological architecture that's going to determine which of those potential outcomes come out. I think that's why I say. It, at the baseline, it's the culture, and then the culture it's the laws, and then from there, the economy, and then the architectures of the technology. But at the at end of the day, it's around that culture, and that culture is shaped by stories and visions and dreams and myths. Um, and it's from that where we're able to kind of live into a future that we want to, uh, you know, kind of exist in and live into. So. Um, yeah, and I think that so it, I, I don't think we can only look at say the the future of technology to understand where society is going. Right, it has to be the the types of um, storytellers that that tell the story of the future that we actually want to live into. Which I think that if you look at you know this these these ranges of potential, that's where maybe the astrological um, 
you know, kind of world builders and storytellers and world growers uh, are able to kind of paint and do some future dreaming into a potentials that we want to live into. And then what that experience may feel like. And then the challenge is to figure out what are the steps we need to do to get there? Because it could be that, you know, the dystopias that we have with the Terminator, that creates one reality, but then that becomes a roadmap, which is a, a critique of dystopia, is that it is is trying to critique what the, um, I guess a cautionary tale to to say these are potential bad things, but it's very easy to take that cautionary tale and get so excited and then create it as a roadmap that you then build and live into hmm. in a way without really thinking about how it could actually go above and beyond whatever the dystopic elements are. So I think that's the caveat that I have as we talk about all these technologies, it's still at the, the core, it has to be grounded within a deeper context of stories and myths that are both regenerative and in right relationship to the world around us and with each other. Yeah. So, so what is the future you want to create and setting that as an intention and then going out and, and creating it? Creating or telling stories and creating cultural artifacts that inspire other people that help you create it. Because mm. you can't, you can't sort of the, the you know, Monica Bilasquita talks about world building as kind of a colonial way of going onto something that exists and building on top of it. Whereas another metaphor is world growing or world cultivating, where you're trying to cultivate a world that you want to live into, but it's a collaborative participatory process that requires a community of shared cultural values to co-create it with you. So it's a more participatory uh, uh, orientation rather than sort of going out and then you know achieving it all on your own, which I think is a part of why I, I at least find so much uh, excitement around the potentials of virtual reality is that you can actually have a virtually mediated experience of those worlds that you want to live into that could be created by a community. And then from there, if it's inspiring enough, then to go build it. And so uh, as we talk about all these different things and all these different potentials for what technology could go, each one of them, I think, are talking about ways in which the this technology could serve us and help us grow deeper as individuals, rather than those more kind of dystopic versions of modeling and, and trying to know, you know, violates our, our mental privacy, try to model our identity and be able to nudge our, uh, our, our behaviors in a way that undermines our agency. Mm -hmm. So those neuro rights are kind of a, a, a fundamental human right that needs to be the larger context for how any, any of this develops as well. That makes sense. I think that's a good point to to end on. So, uh, Voices of VR podcast. You've done over like two thousand interviews that you're still releasing. I've uh, probably done over sixteen hundred and I've released over a thousand. Yeah, but okay. episode a thousand is a great to check out. What's the URL? Uh, well, if you go to um, if you search Voices of VR one thousand, it should come up. But if you go to twitter.com slash Kent by at least right now my 1000th episode is penned as my pen tweet so you can go directly there I just mean what's your URL for your oh, website sorry. in general <laughs> I thought you were asking me the URL no, 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 for no, I'm not gonna you, yeah like a <laughs> 30 character long and all the dashes and everything uh, voices of vr.com uh, is uh, my podcast okay um and voices of AI possibly bring it back at some point Yep, I want to bring back the voices of AI and esoteric voices at some point as well. So okay, I see that um, here soon. Um, and then voices of math, voices of philosophy, decentralized web. But these are other things that are probably come out as well at some point. We'll see. I, I think you got to scale ambitious. it back a little bit with the seven podcast thing. I, <laughs> I don't think that's like humanly. I think you're you speaking of superhuman intelligences. Uh, you you know got to act within the bounds of uh, your human limitations currently unless you're able to come up with an ai to achieve all these things yeah we'll see well yeah i and i would love to just be connected to the larger uh, astrological community that you've cultivated here so as i start to relaunch the esoteric voices i need to figure out how to um you know as i've you know kind of metaphorically coming out of the astrological closet for a number of years then how to uh, make it so this work that i'm doing uh, could find an audience to not only support the interviews but also potentially building things within virtual reality and these different you know software pieces of um, experiences i want to uh, that's the thing that i get really excited about is these things we're talking about abstractly to go actually kind of build some of the stuff and uh, mostly on the vr side than the ai side um, i'm not going to be creating um, artificial general intelligence at least yet so oh, yeah. okay <laughs> so I'll put that off for a decade or so yeah I'll, I'll, I'll wait for a little bit until they figure out a little bit more so yeah to the 2040s all right uh <laughs> thanks a lot for joining me today this is a lot of fun yeah thanks for having me out here it's uh, been a, a great blast and like i said like going into an astrology conference for like an, a two-day intensive so it's been a lot of fun right all right cool um all right well that's it i guess for this episode of the casual astrology podcast or the astrology pod podcast or whatever it becomes in the future Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks to all the patrons for supporting us, and we'll see you again next time. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, 
Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. And finally, special thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, and the AstroGold Astrology app, which is available for iPhone and Android. You can find out more information about that at astrogold.io.